I want to start by personally thanking everyone who has stuck with me and my videos throughout the years. From the old school wavy viewers to the meme history fans to the more recent true crime junkies that we've got around here, I appreciate all of you guys for rocking with me on this tumultuous surfing of the web. Today's upload is special in that it's not only a celebration of the wavy web surf channel recently passing a million subscribers, it also serves as a bit of a Christmas present for you guys at home. With it being the holiday season, I thought I'd slap together a three hour supercut of some of my most wholesome and feel good internet stories. Now these videos are very special to me and I would be lying if I told you that I didn't choke up at the editing table while making a lot of them. So if you or someone you know is in need of a dose of positivity, look no further than this supercut. Thank you all for being fans and I hope you enjoy. On 4chan, harassment and bullying is commonplace, but typically members of the site save their vitriol for people that truly cross them and deserve it. That said, when an anonymous individual took a photo of an overweight man dancing at a party and uploaded the image to 4chan in an effort to make fun of the guy, the community does the unexpected, not only chastising the bully, but tracking down the dancing man himself and making the situation right. This is the story of 4chan's dancing man. Fair warning, to begin the story, we have to browse through a pretty grimy 4chan thread. A lot of degenerates in this one. So act natural, don't make eye contact. Trust me, everything will be fine. Do we even know who is this 4chan? On February 13th of 2015, a thread would be published of 4chan's politically incorrect board titled The Official Friday Fat Shaming Thread. The post read, That's right, poll. It's time for a fat shaming thread. Fat people are a burden to society. Share your stories and pictures of fat degenerates. Apparently around this time, users of Poll had made it like a weekly ritual on Friday to just gather around and pick on the overweight people. It was pretty much a thread full of pictures taken from Google images and people joking on the folks in these images. Now, after scrolling down the page for some time, eventually one comes across today's post of interest, The Dancing Man. The original caption of this post read, quote, spotted this specimen trying to dance the other week. He stopped when he saw us laughing. Now, considering the state of affairs for this thread, you would think that people would come across this image and immediately go into the comments and start mocking the man in these photos for his weight. But what actually happens is the guy who posted the photos immediately starts getting flack for uploading them. Apparently this poster had gone too far. That pic hit me right in the feels. God damn you for adding to that guy's misery. Now I've been a regular on poll for years now and I just have to say that this is not what our culture is about. You sir are a foul person. You're a dick. He enjoying himself and burning calories. You really think him being embarrassed and depressed is now going to help him? He's going straight for the cheeseburger to feel better. Yeah, you would think in a nasty thread like this, it's anything goes, but apparently, at least according to these 4chan users, this anonymous poster had crossed the line. After all, this guy was claiming he was out in the real world harassing a guy at a dance party who was just trying to have a little bit of fun. And for what, just so this guy could be the cool dude on 4chan for 10 minutes? Yeah, bro, that's uh, really gonna get you laid right there. Even the anons on this fat shaming thread were self-aware enough to realize that this was cringe and lame. And they spoke their mind, really made it a point that this type of IRL creep shot fat shaming wasn't okay. The creep shot culprits post was shared across the site where it would continue to incite more outrage amongst 4chan's user base. Check out the response from users of 4chan's b-board. This makes me sad. This guy looks totally fucking alright. Doesn't deserve laughs for trying to dance. Nah, not even funny by B's low standards. I wanna buy that bro a beer. Fuck, just let the guy dance, man. This is how supervillains are created. By March, this injustice was being spread outside of 4chan and across the general web. People expressed the desire to reach out or find the dancing man who was bullied by the anonymous 4chan user. You know, they thought perhaps if they could track the guy down, they could do something that would right the wrong caused by this cheeky 4chan poster who was taking photos of them. Thus begins the spread of hashtag fine dancing man. The hunt started getting traction on March 5th when a Twitter user named Captain Fitch got a viral tweet addressing the dancing man. Twitter, can we find the man in this photo and tell him that he is beautiful and we love him? 
This tweet leads to a separate call to action by web journalist and activist Cassandra Fairbanks. Anyone know this man or who posted this? There's a huge group of ladies in Los Angeles who would like to do something special. Thousands online were collectively trying to track down the dancing man with the goal of doing something special and making internet history. And not only were they trying to make the dancing man's day, by doing this they would be spiting the bully and showing other potential bullies out there that shit like this isn't okay. After about 24 hours of hashtag find dancing man and the calls to action to locate this fellow had popped off, well, someone would come forward. On March 6th, Cassandra Fairbanks would share a photo from the enigmatic dancing man himself. He had been found and identified himself through Twitter. Turns out his name was Sean O'Brien. He was a 48-year-old single man working in the finance industry in the United Kingdom. Sean had been tipped off to the hunt for his identity thanks to an email sent by a friend who noticed his photos everywhere online. Sean would go on to say that he remembered people heckling him at the dance shown in the photos, but he didn't know the photos themselves were taken. So, are you aware that anybody has taken photographs of you? No, 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 no one's taken photographs. I was aware that there was some comments and there was some snide looks and, and whatever, but, and it's happened before, it'll probably happen again, but um, I didn't realize anyone was taking photographs, so that, that comes as a surprise to me. And upon becoming aware of the photos and the outpouring of support, Sean saw potential here for something good and decided to come forward. So what's next? The internet found their dancing man and the man himself welcomed the attention. The possibilities for good here were limitless. Well, Cassandra's plot was basically to round up as many of her female friends as possible and throw a dance party for Sean. I mean, what a better way to stick it to the bully than surround Sean with a bunch of women for a night of dancing and festivities. So Cassandra, along with her friend Hope Lee, reportedly share this dance party plan with over a thousand women in the Los Angeles area. Many are on board with the idea, which leads to Hope forming the Dance Free Movement as a base of operations. It was an anti-bullying campaign consisting of primarily female activists with the goal of spreading body positivity. And not long after a GoFundMe is initiated to fund this hypothetical dance event. It quickly starts getting thousands of dollars and by the end of the campaign the GoFundMe had raised just over 40k for Sean's proposed dance party in Los Angeles. More pieces of the dance party puzzle would fall into place, with celebrities pledging their assistance with the music and entertainment elements of the party. It was going to be a star-studded lineup, Pharrell was coming, Moby, Andrew WK, and others voiced their intent to attend. And after a couple months planning, the event was given a date, Saturday, May 23rd, a dance party to celebrate Sean O'Brien. As the days closed in on the date of the party, Sean O'Brien was flown from the United Kingdom to the United States by the Dance Free Movement. And of course he knew he was being thrown a party, but it's unlikely that he knew that it was going to be this badass of a party. London man who was initially mocked online for his dance move is now dancing up a storm here in Los Angeles tonight. There's a packed house inside celebrating him, supporting him, and anyone else who's ever been bullied. efforts raised $70,000 that will go to anti-bullying and positive body image programs in the U.S. and U.K. Organizers will be posting new pictures of O'Brien dancing, maybe even sending a message to those who once mocked him. If I knew who they were, I would just invite them to come and dance because I think that the, the kind of people who are doing these things, they're probably in a lot of pain themselves. The kindness and every it's overwhelming, it really is overwhelming. See you all out tonight. It's just phenomenal and I really I can only say thanks to everyone. You're real, you're all special, you're all making this gonna really make it a special night. Um, and just enjoy, smile, dance, and wake up in the morning and think that was a good night. <laughs>
The event was a complete success, and you have to admit, putting all this together, it was a powerful statement. I mean, imagine a situation, what if instead of Sean, this was like some little kid, and their photo was posted, and it became this cyberbullying thing, which got spread around, and he became a living meme, and it like ruined his life forever. It's good to know in a hypothetical situation like that, that there are people online who would actually have your back and fight for you. While it doesn't happen as often as it should, sometimes a captivating video or set of photos can disrupt the often cynical and vitriolic attitude of the internet and galvanize folks to stand up for something good. Which is what I think we had happen here. I mean, even the users of the infamous 4chan message boards knew that this was jacked up and they immediately came to Sean's defense when these photos were posted. And going off of that, despite what many articles about this story would like you to think, 4chan wasn't the villain in this case. In fact, Sean wouldn't have gotten the support he did if it wasn't for the members of the page initially stepping to his defense and spreading the story to other outlets. Without the well-intentioned 4chan users, Cassandra and the other people likely never would have heard about this at all. The anti-bullying statement never would have been made. Ironically, one of the most famous body positivity events was sparked because someone went too far in a fat shaming thread on 4chan. And don't misconstrue what I'm saying here, I don't think we should have more fat shaming threads, I just thought that was interesting. As for Sean himself, well, after the party, he returned back to his normal life, likely touched by the show of support he received from the ladies who organized his party and the kind messages from the internet denizens around the world. An update on his Instagram page in 2017 sums up how impactful the whole experience was for him. Two years ago today, I was lucky enough to meet these four and create the most unlikely friendships I may have imagined. My life will never be the same because of them. Love you all. And as for the 4chan user that posted the images that started all of this, well, they remain anonymous to this day, never once commenting publicly on the event. It would be interesting to hear what this person has to say about the party. Would they apologize or double down? I reckon we'll never know. But what's certain is that his post inadvertently led to one of the internet's most wholesome community efforts, a real middle finger to bullies out there. The dancing man was redeemed one of the most famous living meme styled characters in history is the troll -a -lol guy aka Edward Kill. <laughs> Known across 4chan, Reddit, and YouTube for his widely beloved trolling anthem, few are actually aware of the deeply emotional tale behind this man's ascension to memehood and viral fame. From World War II battlefields to international music stages, this is the story of Mr. Trollolol, aka Edward Gill. Before the memes, before Trollolo, there was Edward Kill, and Edward went through a lot before becoming the internet meme icon you know him as today. Let's start from the beginning. Edward was born September 4th, 1934 in Smolensk, USSR. And as you can probably imagine, growing up in Soviet Russia during one of the most tumultuous eras in human history, it probably wasn't easy for young Edward. During World War II, Edward's kindergarten was bombed during a Nazi invasion of the city. He survived only to soon after become separated from his mother during the city's evacuation effort. For the next two years, Edward would be an orphan and he was relocated about a thousand kilometers to the east in the city of Bakovo where he stayed at a foster home. This home was said to have been in poor condition, lacking basic facilities and food at the time was scarce. It would be easy for someone in this position to become dejected and depressed, but not Edward. Edward found hope in his own voice. He was a gifted singer, and during wartime, he often left the foster home to visit the local military hospital where he would sing for the wounded soldiers. He honed his voice during the dark times and remained confident that things would eventually get better. After Edward's home city of Smolensk was liberated from the Nazis in 1943, his life began to improve. After the liberation, Edward was taken from the foster home and relocated back to his home city of Smolensk. And fortunately, he was reunited with his mother here. After the war completely ended, the two would move to Leningrad where Edward would finish school and enter college. Around the time of his college education, Edward would meet a woman named Zoya and the two would get married and have a son together. Also during college, Edward's vocal talent would become apparent to the Soviet public when he began performing at opera houses around Leningrad, where he would earn fame thanks to his bold baritone voice. <laughs> Сердце 
Folks around Leningrad really liked Ed, and his part-time singing gig would eventually blossom into a full-time one when there was more of a demand for his vocal talent. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, Edward Kill became renowned throughout Russia for his performances of pop tunes and Russian folk songs. Which brings us to a particular Russian song that was a favorite of Mr. Edward Kill, a song called I Am Very Glad As I'm Finally Returning Back Home. The original version of this song was composed by a famous 20th century Russian songwriter named Arkady Ostrovsky. Now the original version of this song was said to contain lyrics describing an American-like cowboy riding his horse home after being out on the trail for a long time and just having this overwhelming feeling of relief, you know, that he's about to be home and able to relax. And with this song referencing an American cowboy in mind, consider the uh, Cold War propaganda machine running on all cylinders. Edward Kill would be out of his mind if he performed this song publicly. Lyrics aside though, he loved the composition and its melody and overall positive vibe. He wanted to bring it to the big stage, so he got creative. Basically, Edward took the melody of this song and removed all the lyrics and replaced them with non-lexical vocal sounds. You know, the la 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 la, tra la 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 la, tro la 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 you know what I mean. And what do you know, the tro la la song as we know it now was born. Edward began performing his version of this song in the late 1960s, but the famous performance you're all familiar with was recorded in 1976 on a live television broadcast. While Edward's version of this song was indeed popular, it wasn't like a chart-topping creation by any means. It was just a happy, feel-good song that he had in his repertoire that he would bust out from time to time. Over the years, Edward's version of I Am Very Glad As I'm Finally Returning Back Home would be largely forgotten by the Soviet public and Kill would move on with his career, performing until he retired in the 1990s, opting to spend more time with his family. Now, let's fast forward from the 1990s to 2010. The Cold War's over, Putin is riding a horse, and this little creation known as the internet is really popular around the world. And on the internet, memes are taking off like never before before on websites like 4chan and reddit. Rage comics, advice animal image macros, and of course the troll face are all in vogue. Troll face in particular was arguably at its peak popularity at this point and so was the fascination with online trolling in general. In the early 2010s, being known as an internet troll was like the cool hip thing that every 14 year old wanted to do. You know, you go on a forum and make a rage bait post or send somebody a troll face and then you run to your high school buddies and you're like, bro, I epically trolled this guy on the internet. That's so much karma, dude. And there were many tactics of trolling that were popular at this time but here are the big three in my opinion. You've got guys that would make troll bait YouTube videos, kind of like what Chad Warden did, or you had folks that would write a rage bait comment or a forum post, and then you had people using spoof links to send an unsuspecting internet user to a bait and switch video akin to the classic Rickroll. And this Rickroll type trolling is where we circle all the way back to our boy Edward Kill and his famous 1976 performance. On December 9th of 2009, a Russian speaking YouTuber known as Real Papa Pit dug up an old archive of this performance and uploads it to his YouTube channel, adding the troll tagline to the title of the song. Another YouTuber would clip just the portion of Edward laughing and upload it to his channel. <laughs> this out of context clip of Edward laughing would be reposted to the RWTF subreddit where it intrigued Western internet users who had no idea who the man was or why the hell he was laughing and singing so strangely. Needless to say, the video and the song was one of those things that would stick with you. You know, you would watch the video and it would remain with you for the rest of the day and the song stuck in the back of your head and you just couldn't get it out. <laughs> And with this effect in mind, this is where the trolls stepped in and started spreading this thing all over the place to mess with people. It worked exactly like the Rick roll. You make a post or a call to action prompting people to click a link, they click it, and well, they wind up somewhere where they didn't want to be. In this case, it was Edward laughing at their ass for getting tricked. <laughs> Ha ha ha!
It was a lighthearted prank and was all in good fun, and hell, some people decided to stick around and hear the rest of Edward's song. Because of the excessive amount of lol lol lols in the song, and the fact that the video itself was funny, and trolls were heavily involved in making this popular on the internet, that troll title just kind of worked and stuck with this video. That's what the internet would forever remember Edward's song as. Trollolo would get tens of millions of views in the following months, and the video became the hot meme, with it not only being popular online, but becoming popular in mainstream culture. La, 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 la. By mid-2010, this performance was plastered across the internet and was gobbling up YouTube clicks. It had established itself as an instant viral video classic by this point. But what of the man behind the Trollolo song, the talented Edward Kill? Well, unbeknownst to many, the then 75-year-old Edward was very much aware of his living meme status, and boy was he thrilled that so many people were enjoying his song. Edward was beyond happy that his old song was given a new lease on life and felt a profound sense of joy that it was bringing laughter to an entirely new generation. He embraced being Mr. Trollolo and saw the internet's sudden obsession with him as an unexpected blessing. At the time of the meme's peak popularity, Edward was frequently asked to sing the Trollolo song by passersby on the streets of St. Petersburg, where if time permitted, he would cheerfully oblige, such as this example recorded by the Murinsky YouTube channel. Eventually, Edward would actually address the internet directly and thank everyone for keeping Trollolo alive, even inviting them to create their own lyrics for the song if they so pleased. Поэтому я хочу к вам обратиться, и чтобы вы сами придумали текст песни, вот этой вот, которая называется «Вокализ». Потому что в каждой стране, наверное, человек по-своему поймет эту песню. И после того, как вы напишете слова для песни, не обязательно для всей песни, одного куплета, может быть, две строчки, и после этого, когда вы напишете, Мы соберемся в интернете все вместе, договоримся, когда, какой день, какое время, и вместе все споем вот на новый текст эту песню. Благодаря интернету и вот этой энергии, которая нас всех вместе соединяет, мы можем радоваться, смеяться, любить и воспитывать детей. It seemed like he was having so much fun with being a living meme, and about a year and a half or so after the Mr. Trollolo meme really popped off, he would actually come out of retirement for one last song and do a live performance of the Trollolo song on stage in a way circling back to that big stage performance in 76 that started the genesis of Trollolo. <laughs> It would be an understatement to say that Mr. Trollolo was a beloved figure. He was a meme icon and represented the internet's offbeat sense of humor. His legacy as a meme will live on forever. That said, unfortunately, Edward himself is just a mortal man like you or I. On June 4th of 2012, the world was met with tragic news when it was being reported that Mr. Edward Kill had passed away from complications caused by a stroke. He was 77 years old. When this news hit the internet, in a show of appreciation, users came together, flocking to the Trollolo video and left kind words and paid their respects to the Russian baritone who had brought joy to millions around the world. As an orphaned boy growing up in one of the darkest eras of human history, it would have been easy for Edward to be a person lost to time a nameless casualty of circumstances out of his control. But Edward found a purpose early in life that not only guided him to success, but gave him hope. Bringing joy and happiness to others was that purpose. Through the vehicle of his voice, he helped others escape from their own momentary struggles to get away from stress, and for a brief moment, smile. From the wounded soldiers in the military hospital to the opera house patrons of Leningrad and the millions of people on the internet, Edward reminded us to laugh a little, and for that, 
he'll be dearly missed. A personal favorite of mine, The Jack Ryan Miracle is a tale involving a grocery store clerk assisting an autistic boy who had entered his store. Footage of the kind act would go viral on Facebook, not only melting the hearts of hundreds of thousands around the world, but it changed the lives of the store clerk and Jack Ryan himself forever. You might need a box of tissues for this one, guys. Today's story takes place on July 29th of 2018 at the Rouse's Grocery Store located on Drusillis Lane in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Of the many employees clocking in for their workday, one of these employees was 20-year-old Jordan Taylor. Jordan came from a working-class family. His mother also worked for a different Rouse's store and hoped that one day she would be able to send Jordan to college. Now, about halfway through Jordan's shift on this day, a father and his son would enter the dairy department. This was Sid Edwards and his 17-year-old son, Jack Ryan Edwards. As mentioned briefly in the introduction, Jack Ryan was an autistic child, and he had difficulty interpreting social cues. And according to his family, the grocery store was often a distressing place for Jack Ryan. And with that said, this is when we get to the magic moment that Jack Ryan's family calls a miracle. After entering the dairy department, Jack Ryan would approach Jordan as he is stocking the orange juice cooler. He begins watching Jordan intently as he carefully blocks the bottles, aligning them in neat uniform rows. Jordan eventually notices Jack's interest in what he's doing and turns to ask him if he wanted a bottle of orange juice from the case. Jack Ryan doesn't respond to the question, seemingly fixated on the orange juice case itself. Momentarily puzzled, Jordan soon realizes that it wasn't the orange juice bottles themselves that Jack Ryan was interested in. It was the task that he was performing. Jack Ryan wanted to emulate him. He wanted to be a worker and stock the shelves. So Jordan turns and asks Jack Ryan, Hey, do you want to help me? Jack Ryan, realizing that Jordan understood what he wanted, says, Help me, as he motions towards the orange juice cooler. It was established. The two would be working together on stocking this cooler. So Jordan, in a soft tone, begins to verbally guide Jack Ryan, patiently showing him how to place the bottles with his hands. Eventually, Jack Ryan starts to get the hang of things, and he blocks the orange juice by himself. He takes over as Jordan watches over him. For that moment, Jack Ryan was a bona fide Rouse's employee. For him, this was likely a monumental moment, and Jack Ryan's father couldn't believe what he was witnessing. He pulls out his camera and starts recording so he can show his family. The emotional weight of this scene can be felt through the screen. Put another one. Put it. <laughs> You're so good, man. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm watching a miracle in action. You know Jordan? I was watching uh, Jordan style. We've been here 30 minutes. Jordan would stock groceries alongside Jack Ryan for close to half an hour before the two parties went their separate ways. Jack Ryan left the store seemingly in good spirits, and his father touched by the kindness exemplified by Jordan. Jordan would continue his work for the day. He was certainly glad that he was able to help Jack Ryan, but at the time it's likely he underestimated the weight of his deed and how much it would mean to the Edwards family. But in due time, the Edwards family would make sure that Jordan Taylor knew how much this meant to them. Later in the day, Jack Ryan's father would share the video he recorded at Rouse's with Jack Ryan's sister. Her name is Delaney. Delaney was so moved by the video that she felt compelled to share the video to Facebook so that others could be inspired by Jordan's act of kindness. And to say that people were inspired would be an understatement. The video soon went viral on Facebook with it getting over a million views in a matter of days and scores of commenters poured in from around the world expressing their support. What an amazing young man to help with the patience to allow this. Your mama must be proud, Jordan. People not familiar with autism have no idea how much this simple act of kindness can impact a person and their family. That young man looked completely at peace and happy. Only good things for you both. Jordan, such a kind and selfless act. I'm sure you made Jack's day and everyone else's who got to witness your blessing. You are a breath of fresh air, Jordan. Please, someone offer this amazing young man a college scholarship. The sentiment expressed by this last commenter was shared by many in this comment section. They wanted to repay Jordan for his kind deed that he perpetrated. If only there was some way for thousands of people to get together and raise money or do something special. 
I wonder where this is going. Well, Jack Ryan's sister Delaney would end up starting a GoFundMe with the goal of raising $100,000 so that Jordan could attend college. The campaign was called Send Jordan from Rouse's to School. This thing would go live around the time that the video was spreading on Facebook, and before you knew it, you had thousands of people coming to donate money. It was truly a beautiful sight to see. Now what's Jordan's reaction to all the hubbub online regarding what he did? Well, Jordan couldn't believe he was getting this much praise for what he did. In his eyes, he was simply doing the right thing in the situation, showing empathy and compassion for an inquisitive teenager with autism. In the following days, Jack Ryan and his family would be accompanied by a news affiliate and they went back to the Rouses to meet up with Jordan Taylor. When reporters asked Jordan Taylor why he did what he did, he tells him he was just being himself. Taylor's mother, who also works at a different Rouses, is who instilled the values in her son. It's always help others when you can. But Taylor didn't do it for the attention. Never pictured all this would happen. I was just being me. That's it. I just wanted to help somebody else out. Enjoy something. As for Jack Ryan, around the time of the video going viral, it was reported that Rouse's had actually reached out to the family and offered him a position as a worker at the store. But eventually the offer would be respectfully declined by the family due to concerns with his ability to perform the work independently in such a socially demanding environment. Regardless, it was a kind gesture by Rouse's. By the middle of August, an unbelievable milestone in regard to Jordan's college fund was met. It exceeded its goal of $100,000, raising over $135,000 in total. Life-changing money for a working-class young man who now had the money he needed to get his college education and pursue his dream of becoming a teacher. I'm, I'm watching a miracle in action. You know Jordan? And good things kept coming for Jordan. In mid-August, it was revealed by Kieran Chala of WFAB 9 News that Jordan was gifted a brand new 2017 Chevy Cruze by a local credit union who wanted to highlight his good character. And the most important development of all, in late August, it was reported that Jordan Taylor had been accepted to college and would be attending the fall semester. It would be revealed that Jordan Taylor had selected to attend Grambling State University, reportedly choosing to study childhood education. A new chapter in his life had begun thanks to a singular act of kindness committed back at that Rouse's grocery store. You don't need words to say what's in your heart. This smile alone says it all as Jack Ryan and Taylor stock shelves in the cooler. All done. Good job. That's perfect. Unfortunately, I'm unable to provide any recent updates on Jordan as it seems he's decided to go private, likely focusing on school rather than being in the public limelight. A wise decision. However, that being said, I was able to get an update courtesy of Jack Ryan's sister, Delaney, the woman responsible for the GoFundMe that changed Jordan's life. She had this to say, Jordan and I still talk sometimes. We've been meaning to hang out with Jack, but haven't gotten around to it lately. She continues, Jordan is a really great person. Like genuinely, I'm still amazed by him and that there are still young people that are that kind. I still can't believe that the GoFundMe got over $135,000 and I'm so elated for him. Every time I think about it, I can't wipe the grin off my face because he deserves it, all of it. He's so humble and gentle and I truly hope the best for him. Jack, I call him Ziggy, is doing better lately and has actually been able to go back into the Rouse's store that he met Jordan in. For a while, that wasn't a possibility. I want to give a big thanks to Delaney for this comment, and hopefully Jack is able to tolerate Rouse's in the future. This story hit home for me on many levels, but as someone who has a close disabled family member, I can't tell you how much it means whenever someone goes out of their way to make that family member feel included in an activity. That small show of compassion goes a long way. More often than not, folks either just don't understand or appreciate the struggles of the disabled, leading many opting to avoid interaction entirely out of fear of an awkward encounter. In my late teens and early 20s, I worked at a grocery store just like Jordan did, and I know how easy it is on a busy Sunday to waive customer interaction for the possibility of blocking an aisle faster. But it's what you do under stressful circumstances that show your true character. Jordan Taylor did the right thing on July 29th of 2018. He included Jack Ryan Edwards. 
And for that, I and thousands of others online can't thank him enough. That, my friends, was the story of Jack and Jordan's grocery store miracle. I never pictured all this would happen. I was just being me. I'm, I'm watching a miracle in action. You know Jordan? The story of bus monitor Karen is admittedly a bit of an emotional roller coaster. What begins as a depressing showcase of bullying quickly turns positive after thousands of Redditors get involved. Their intervention completely flips the narrative and this becomes one of the most touching stories to come out of 2012. So let's begin with a bit of Karen's backstory. Karen Klein was a woman of humble means, a grandmother living in the town of Greece, New York. She had been widowed since 1995 and had lived alone ever since. To support herself financially in these later years, Karen got a job as a school bus driver where she drove for 20 years until in 2009 she would step down and take the role of a school bus monitor for the Greece School District. And if you don't know what a school bus monitor is, well basically it's an adult that's paid to sit in the back of the bus with all the troublemaking kids and make sure they're not smoking cigarettes and drinking travel bottles of Skull Vodka. So that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but pretty much they're there to make sure everybody's seated and being quiet. And most importantly, they're there to act as a check and balance against kids who might want to pick on or bully other kids on the bus. Which of course leads us to the infamous incident in 2012 where Karen found herself becoming the target of the bullying that ironically she was supposed to stop. It happens on bus number 784. This bus routinely was ridden by four students whose identities I'll keep anonymous, but they were notoriously nasty and often targeted Karen for her looks and age. Starting in the spring of 2012, these seventh grade students began secretly filming their merciless mockery sessions wherein they verbally abused Karen on the bus. Karen, 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 do, you think you Karen. do um, Karen, why are you hanging? Why are you wearing sunglasses over glasses? You gotta get that. Karen's such a bitch. <laughs> Karen, what'd you get? Look at them witch hands. Oh, Shit, oh, Damn! Karen, what'd you get those glasses, baby? <laughs> <laughs> and if that wasn't in and of itself bad enough, they would take these recordings and upload them to Facebook. Karen would take the abuse on these occasions, finding that the children were unresponsive to disciplinary measures. All she could really do was try her best to ignore them and stomach the vitriol, and this proved difficult. It was her job to weed out bad eggs on the school bus, but I doubt she expected them to be this rotten. Oh my god, you're so fat. Karen, you're fat. Dude, you're so fat. You take up like the whole entire seat. Oh, no. Put those oh my glasses. god, your glasses are foggy from your freaking sweat, you fat ass. Dude, put those glasses back on. I can't stand looking at your face. Karen, put those sunglasses back on. Freaking looking like a troll. Badass. Look at all this flab right here. Unless you have something nice to say, don't say anything about it. How about you shut the f*** up? <laughs> Your feet are cut. You can f***ing see the sweat dripping down her face. I know. Look at it. Karen, are you sweating? Oh my Karen, god, look at the feet. Are you sweating? Are you fucking going? She's not sweating. Why is there water on your face? I'm crying. Fucked yeah. up. Look at this. Because you want this? Oh, too bad. <laughs> what that is? <laughs> What's your address so I can freaking piss all over your door? <laughs> I'm gonna fucking take a crack in your mouth. Look at that shit. You'll take it with me. You think you want to pull this? She's gonna die of fucking diabetes because she's so damn cute. Why don't, why don't you take everybody else's picture? Shut up with your fake, fake gold. Yeah, no. Fake gold, that's fucking plastic. No. Wait, wait, wait. You're a troll. You're a troll. You're a troll. You're a troll. Okay. troll. Okay. Okay. Karen, did you get did you get that purse on layaway? Nah, she got it in the garbage can at Walgreens. <laughs> <laughs> you probably got that from Dollar Tree. Family Dollar, but you don't have a family because they all killed themselves because they didn't want to be near you. They didn't want to be near you. 
The particular video just played was probably the most brutal of all of the recordings, featuring some of the most vile insults and derogatory statements. The other recordings filmed by the kids never seemed to catch the internet's attention, but this one through a miraculous stroke of luck was stumbled upon by the right pair of eyes. On June 19th, a YouTuber known as Capital Trigga would find this particular video on Facebook and subsequently re-uploaded it to YouTube where it would go on to absolutely explode, shocking and disgusting over 1 million viewers within 48 hours. Comments would begin flooding in, the majority of which were chastising the children for their actions and just expressing general outrage over this situation. The general sentiment here was something had to be done about these awful kids. How could you keep doing that after Karen started crying? Those boys have no heart. I really hope their parents know about this and are ashamed of how terribly they've raised their children. Something needs to be done about this. I'm not saying to harm the people who took part in this horrible act, but as a teenager I believe that some type of action needs to be done to show all other teenagers and younger peers that this is not okay at all. And the sentiment expressed in the online YouTube comment section would also be echoed offline within the mainstream media world. Now to a video ricocheting across the country. A video a number of parents say they plan to sit down and show to their children to start a conversation about bullying of all kinds. The unlikely target in this video, a 68-year-old woman. And here's ABC's David Muir. This story became somewhat of a national headline, with some news pundits even getting into contact with Karen herself. The news pundits did their best to make Karen feel better about the situation, and there were some companies that even reached out and offered paid vacations. But it really seemed like all she wanted was a simple apology from the kids. What do you want to happen with to these kids? I want them to um, make sure that they never do this again to anybody. Um, I would like them to be at least kept off the bus for a year. So we received some statements through the police from, from two of the children who, uh, who were tormenting you. Josh wrote, Quote, I'm so sorry for the way I treated you. When I saw the video, I was disgusted and could not believe that I did that. What do you make of that? Of course it's going to say anything. I mean, Jan, she always had this smirk on his face. I don't know, maybe that's the way he really looks. But he always, it was like after he said something, you know, I mean, he always liked to cause trouble no matter what it was. Even if it wasn't picking on me, it was something else. So I just don't think I would believe anything Josh had to say. Another child, Wesley, said, quote, I feel really bad about what I did. I wish I had never done those things. If that had happened to someone in my family, like my mother or grandmother, I would be really mad at the people who did that to them. Do you accept these apologies? I haven't gotten any yet. One is supposed to be being mailed, but I haven't gotten that one. So the other two I might not get anything from anyway. It is reported that the kids responsible for harassing Karen would all apologize, but at least according to her, these apologies seemed insincere, and they would do little to stop the wrath that the kids would face from the internet and mainstream media alike. And with that said, what would exactly happen to these children who were responsible for recording the disgusting video? Well, aside from receiving a considerable amount of death threats and overwhelming hate, all four students responsible were suspended from the school system for an entire year and given 50 hours community service. If you want to argue the devil's advocate case that these kids shouldn't have been bandwagoned on so hard and that this was just a lapse of judgment one might have as a dumb middle school kid, I'm gonna fucking take a crack in your mouth. That's fine, but I'd like to add that two years after this incident, it's reported that two of the kids involved in the bus incident allegedly bullied and filmed a special needs child in the school bathroom. So with that in mind, uh, it's really hard for me to feel bad here.
But with that said, it's not really the punishment of the kids that's remarkable about this story. It's more so how people came together and rallied behind Karen and what they did to support her in this situation. And that support was thousands of anonymous online strangers coming together to raise money. While this story was making its rounds in the mainstream media, an Indiegogo fundraiser was quietly initiated on the R Assistance subreddit by Redditor Heavy Balls Are Heavy, real name Max Sidorov. Max's initial goal for the campaign was to raise enough money for Karen to enjoy a nice vacation, but the campaign would completely outperform expectations, raising over $700,000 in proceeds, all of which would go directly to Karen Klein herself. what gratitude looks like. Strangers brought together after a few moments of inhumanity became a groundswell of compassion. Saw your fault. <laughs> ABC News was there overnight as 68-year-old bus monitor Karen Klein met her anonymous benefactor. Nice guy. Nice guy. And I'm very appreciative. Never had close to that amount, you know, yeah. ever. Life has changed. Oh. Yeah, I used to just come home and sit up on my computer and play games, whatever, and now this. <laughs> has started an anti-bullying foundation and plans to tour the U.S. giving talks in October. She says Max has changed her life. I know there are nice people out there. I wasn't always so sure, but I know now. Karen would leave her bus monitoring position after all this was said and done and enter retirement. A reasonable choice considering the lump sum of $700,000 at the age of 68. I'd probably do the same thing. That said, a good sum of this money went to charity. With the help of Max, Karen founded the Karen Klein Anti-Bullying Foundation, which would go on to raise money to promote anti-bullying education in schools. And as for what the kids are doing nowadays, well, that's not exactly known. But considering that allegation which popped up two years after the bus incident, I would imagine they're having bright and prosperous futures, don't you think? I'd like to say this in conclusion. While I'm generally skeptical of these we did it reddit moments as online vigilantism usually ends terribly. But in this case, I gotta give it to reddit. Max and those who supported did well here, and in this case Reddit veered away from harassing the kids and focused more so on supporting the victim, which is the way that this kind of stuff needs to be done and it was really great to see. And what might be the most wholesome story to come out of early 4chan, Mr. Lashua's birthday is a heartwarming tale involving hundreds of anonymous internet users banding together to throw a soon-to-be 90-year-old World War II veteran an unforgettable birthday celebration. This story begins in early September of 2010 in the small city of Gardner, Massachusetts. An anonymous 4chan user from the area had been made aware of a notice posted on a bulletin board inside Gardner's local stop and shop grocery store. The notice was a public invitation to a birthday party being held for this older gentleman. The name of the man having the birthday party wasn't listed, but an image of him was displayed. Additionally, the time, date, and location of the birthday event were also listed. Wanted, people for birthday party, September 4th, 2010, 1 to 4 p.m. at the Ashburnham American Legion. 
The Ashburnham American Legion is a veterans association located in the neighboring town of Ashburnham, about a 20 minutes drive from the store where the birthday bulletin was posted. Apparently the anonymous 4chan user who stumbled across this birthday bulletin was familiar with the man shown in the photo, as Anon was able to identify this man as World War II veteran William J. Lashua. Lashua was a lifelong resident of Ashburnham and was known throughout the local communities. This upcoming birthday for Mr. Lashua was going to be a big one as he was turning 90 years old. Wanting to help with the birthday call to action, the Anon who stumbled across this notice posted it to 4chan's B board in a thread created on September 1st. Everyone sent him a card if not more. He is turning 90 and is a World War II vet. He deserves everything. It was admittedly unreasonable for Anon to ask people to make the trip to Massachusetts and attend the Lashua birthday event in person, so Anon simply encouraged B to send kind birthday cards to the mailing address of the Veterans Association venue hosting the party you know, wishing the man a happy birthday. Now B is generally a place of unchecked toxicity, vitriol, and degeneracy, but something about this simple request asking B to honor the birthday of this 89 year old man, it seemed to crack the armor of even the most jaded and nihilist of 4chan shit posters. The request hit a soft spot. The idea of giving this man the birthday of his life using the power of their weaponized altruism quickly caught on and B was totally considering breaking formation and actually doing something good here. So B said something along the lines of this, Anon, we'd love to send some cards to this old man, but we're not totally sold yet. Sell it harder. Well, if Mr. Lashua turning 90 and also being a World War II veteran didn't warrant reverence already, there were some flattering details about his character that would soon be discovered that kind of set this deal over the edge for 4chan. So it's reported that Mr. Lashua, alongside his late wife Hilda, had six children of their own after he came back from the military and started a family. But they also housed dozens of foster children throughout the years, providing children with a home, safety, and stability until permanent foster parents could be found. Mr. Lashua and his wife had provided a great service for children in need. Unfortunately, though, Hilda had passed away in 2005, and it's assumed that this marked the end of the Lashua's contribution to fostering children. Yeah, this man was a total sweetheart. All things considered, at this point, B was sold. They decided they were gonna do some good here. The call to arms was echoed across 4chan, and 4chaners site-wide rushed to prepare happy birthday postcards and other gifts for Mr. Lashua, which they promptly mailed to the address listed on the invitation. Hundreds of people from across the world claimed they were sending something to Mr. Lashua through postage. Others simply left happy birthday wishes within the original 4chan thread. Some even claimed they might actually attend the event itself. An online birthday wish spirit bomb was forming, and as the days crept closer to September 4th, Mr. Lashua's birthday, the spirit bomb only got bigger. Operation Wish Mr. Lashua Happy Birthday would eventually spread outside of 4chan to other message boards and social media sites, most notably to Reddit. Oh, Reddit, always swaggerjacking 4chan. Anyhow, the spread would only exponentially increase the mail and in-person attendees that could potentially be showing up to this 2,000 square foot Veterans Association building in Ashburnham, Massachusetts. And that being said, you have to wonder at this point, have any of Mr. Lashua's family caught wind of what's going on online? People preparing all of these cards and potentially attending this small get together only meant for family? Well, somebody would catch wind of it and they would make a post to Reddit addressing all of this. It was one of Mr. Lashua's grandsons. Mr. Lashua's grandson would thank people for the support, though he urged people not to show up to the party unless they were from the local area. This is what he said on Reddit. I am William J. Lashua's grandson. Please read this. Kind folks of Reddit, my family and I appreciate the outpouring of love and generosity. There has been a large misunderstanding. The poster which I'm told was found at the Gardner Stop and Shop was more a local notice for people that know him. It was in no way to indicate that he is alone. He has seven children, many grandchildren, and even great-grandchildren. In his younger years, he was a foster parent to dozens of foster children. He is well-liked in the community and will be fully supported on his 90th birthday. 
I ask that if you don't know him to not attend the party, as it is for his friends and family. The venue for the party is a very small hall and will be full to capacity with people he knows and loves. By all means, send cards and well wishes, but please refrain from sending gifts, strippers, cakes, candies, etc. And instead, please make a donation in his name to a local veterans charity. Thank you again for all the love and well wishes. We certainly never expected this. You are awesome, Reddit. Now, please help me spread the word to other outlets and make sure this is a smaller, enjoyable party for him. Now, considering the wishes of Mr. Lashua's grandson here, it was generally agreed by the people on Reddit and 4chan that it probably wasn't the best idea to actually make the trip to Mr. Lashua's party. They figured the hundreds of cards that were supposedly coming in the mail should probably guarantee this guy would have a very special birthday. At this point, all 4chan and Reddit could do was wait for the fateful day of September 4th and cross their fingers in the hopes that the mail would reach Mr. Lashua's Veterans Association venue in time for the party. September 4th, 2010. The day had arrived for Mr. Lashua's birthday party. In the past week, thousands online had claimed to have sent cards and gifts to the Veterans Association venue for Mr. Lashua. The big question on everyone's mind was, did the internet follow through here? Did people really send these cards or was it just a big meme? Well, I'll let you be the judge of it. Hello, my name is Sarah Lozo. My father, William Lashua, celebrated his 90th birthday today. Someone put it on the internet and we got hundreds of cards and gifts and flowers and balloons and cake. Yep, the birthday plan hatched by B was a massive success. Mr. Lashua and his family were blown away by the kindness shown by those of 4chan and the rest of the internet users that contributed to the party. Mr. Lashua received hundreds of birthday cards, gifts, and phone calls to the venue, wishing him a happy birthday. The phone was ringing off the hook. Um, got calls from Japan, Ireland, England, all over the, not just all over the country, but all over the world and it pretty much renewed my faith in humanity for you know people calling to wish somebody a happy birthday that they don't even know who served, served in World War II. We just want to thank everyone for being so kind and wishing him good and to live to be 110. <laughs> thank you all. And even though they were told not to, a handful of Redditors and B users actually attended the event in person, but neither the family or Mr. Lashua seemed to mind their presence. The 90-year-old Mr. Lashua got an unforgettable birthday, and it wouldn't have happened without B. This whole event is yet another example of 4chan's uncanny ability to manifest real-life action out of their campy online chatter. Now, a lot of the time, this real-life action that they manifest can be negative, but in this case, it was overwhelmingly wholesome and positive. As for Mr. Lashua, after his time in the internet limelight, he went back to living a quiet and peaceful life. A couple of years would go by and no updates about Mr. Lashua would be made public. And naturally, people online began to get concerned for him. Well, finally in 2013, almost three years after the Mr. Lashua party, the internet would finally get an update on his condition and what he had been up to. And this update was provided by one of his grandchildren in a thread that they had created on 4chan. Unfortunately though, this wasn't the news that people wanted to hear. Almost three years ago, 4chan made my grandfather, William Lashua, a very famous man. He was turning 90 and is a proud World War II veteran. Because of 4chan, my grandfather and family was overwhelmed by the kindness and respect that we got in honor of my grandfather's birthday. It is with a heavy heart that I tell you that my grandfather passed away last week. He was surrounded by our family as he passed in his home. You can find his obituary in the Gardner News from Gardner, Massachusetts. My family and I continue to thank you for helping my grandfather's 90th one for the books. May he rest in peace.
When an elderly small town food reviewer writes a glowing review for her local Olive Garden restaurant, internet pundits get a hold of the review and start mocking the woman for having a quote, unrefined palate. However, this viral mockery is defeated after a beloved food industry icon comes to the defense of the elderly reviewer. In what could be described as a beautiful showcase of empathy and standing up for what's right, this is the story of Marilyn Haggerty's Olive Garden Review. To begin, I want to introduce you all to the setting of today's story. Grand Forks, North Dakota. Boasting a humble population of approximately 50,000, residents of this somewhat isolated Midwestern city have long enjoyed a quiet, unassuming, and community-focused existence. To give you a better idea of what living in Grand Forks is like, I want to show you some of the tourist attractions listed on its tourism website. Grand Forks offers can't-miss experiences such as Bob's Oil Company, the American Legion Cafe, and of course their state-of-the-art AMC movie theater. Yeah, Grand Forks is keeping it humble, and with these examples shown, I think you can begin to understand why the people living in Grand Forks may be a little bit excited when they heard that Olive Garden was coming to town. And this is exactly what happened in February of 2012. Garden's new stuffed shells with shrimp and a creamy seafood sauce, or with sausage and Alfredo, starting at $9.95 at Olive Garden. Made lots of spaghetti. In late February, Olive Garden, the undisputed king of franchise Italian fare, would be blessing Grand Forks with all of its Alfredo sauce-laden glory. And when opening day came, you could bet your bottom dollar that Grand Forks' own most esteemed culinary critic would be present to try out the exotic flavors provided by the chain. I'd like to try the classic lasagna. Got some nice sharp tastes to it. Time has come for dessert. Meet Marilyn Haggerty. Age 85 at the time of this story, she was a columnist for the city's most popular newspaper, the Grand Forks Herald. For over 20 years, she had written a segment called the Eat Beat, in which she would review restaurants around the local area. Essentially the sweet geriatric version of the Report of the Week, Haggerty's column mostly detailed her experiences dining at franchise chains. While some critics may consider the act of reviewing a chain restaurant redundant or beneath them, Haggerty enjoyed these sorts of eateries. She had given positive reviews to a local Subway, McDonald's, and even Taco Bell and Grand Fork's newly opened Olive Garden was next on the list to be reviewed. Shortly after the new Grand Fork's Olive Garden opened, Haggerty would make her way to the restaurant and enjoy a meal. Afterwards, she would write a review for it, which was overwhelmingly positive. It's a pretty long and detailed review, but here are the highlights. My first visit to Olive Garden was during mid-afternoon, so I could be sure to get in. After a late breakfast, I figured a late lunch would be fashionable. The place is impressive. It's fashioned in Tuscan farmhouse style with a welcoming entryway. There is seating for those who are waiting. It had been a few years since I ate at the older Olive Garden in Fargo, so I studied the two manageable menus offering appetizers, soups and salads, grilled sandwiches, pizza, classic dishes, chicken and seafood, and filled pastas. At length, I asked my server what she would recommend. She suggested chicken Alfredo, and I went with that. Instead of the raspberry lemonade she suggested, I drank water. The chicken Alfredo, $10.95, was warm and comforting on a cold day. The portion was generous. My server was ready with Parmesan cheese. As I ate, I noticed the vases and planters with permanent flower displays on the ledges. There were several dining areas with arched doorways, and there's a fireplace that adds warmth to the decor. On a summer day, I will try the raspberry lemonade that was recommended. All in all, it is the largest and most beautiful restaurant now operating in Grand Forks. It attracts visitors from out of town as well as people who live here. The North Dakota woman who's been writing columns for 50 years but never has one of her restaurant reviews captured this much attention. Bruh. Somehow this seemingly innocuous and most certainly wholesome Olive Garden review would cause Marilyn to become the target of online mockery. Marilyn's review was first criticized by a food blogger in Colorado who would set the patronizing tone which would be shared amongst food critics in regards to Marilyn in her review. This critic says, did you know there was a line at the Olive Garden in Grand Forks through February? Marilyn Haggerty does. She is about the cutest food blogger ever. And if my own grandma didn't already love the Olive Garden, I would adopt Marilyn as my excuse to go to the Olive Garden. 
She ordered chicken alfredo and a water. She turned down the raspberry lemonade. Who goes to the Olive Garden and turns down the raspberry lemonade? Apparently, the Grand Forks Herald needs to up her stipend. Another blogger called her review unwittingly hilarious and joked, I just hope a Popeyes never moves into the neighborhood. Otherwise, everyone's heads may explode like that famous gif from Scanners. Maryland's Olive Garden review would eventually make its rounds on Reddit, where neckbeards would share personal anecdotes and jokes regarding her seemingly over-enthusiastic review of the chain restaurant. A while ago, I was standing at the Taco Bell at the mall waiting for my food when an elderly lady came up beside me to talk to the manager. Her purpose? To send her compliments to the chef because it was the best quesadilla she had ever had. That's adorable! Quote, instead of the raspberry lemonade she suggested, I drank water, end quote. Well, it was a late lunch. Can't get too crazy before dinner. Bro, you got the whole squad laughing with that one. Within days of Marilyn's interview being posted, it seemed like everyone and their grandma had something to say or some sort of joke to crack about it. Because I guess it's a cardinal sin to actually enjoy Olive Garden. I mean, don't get me wrong, Olive Garden isn't my favorite place to eat or anything, but I consider it to be a perfectly fine establishment. I think a lot of the snark thrown in Maryland's direction was rooted in a lack of understanding of what it's like living in a smaller city or town. You aren't surrounded by five-star dining options. Hell, you aren't surrounded by many options in general. And people genuinely get excited when a new restaurant comes to town. And there's nothing wrong with that. With Maryland's Olive Garden review now viral, her column on the Grand Forks Herald website was getting upwards of 10,000 page visits per day. And she personally was getting inundated with emails, with feedback both positive and negative. She would first address her viral fame in an interview with the Village Voice. Here she claps back at her haters. I may sound a little on the defensive to you today because of the emails I've received. One was kind of snotty, but the other four or five were kind of friendly. But my daughter tells me I should go on Facebook and read all of this crap. And I do not have time to let myself be bothered or read all that stuff. I have a Sunday column I'm doing now about a completely different subject. I don't have time to sit here and twit over whether some self-styled food expert likes or does not like my column. The publisher likes it. Marilyn seemed mostly unfazed by the jokes that were coming her way, and she really didn't need any emotional support throughout this, but whether she wanted it or not, she got some. This support came from late famed American celebrity chef Anthony Bourdain. Anthony Bourdain would praise Marilyn for her response to all the attention, tweeting this out on March 8th of 2012. Very much enjoying watching internet sensation Marilyn Haggerty triumph over the snarkologists, myself included. This wouldn't be the only time Bourdain and Haggerty would cross paths. Anthony would invite her to New York City. There, they met and tried out restaurants around town. This resulted in not only a friendship, but a business deal. Anthony offered Marilyn a book deal, wherein she would publish her nearly 30 years of food reviews for the Grand Forks newspaper into one book. This book is called Grand Forks, A History of American Dining. This is a clip of Anthony speaking highly of Marilyn, and it's pretty heartwarming to say the least. Now Tell us about this woman who, 85 years old, she did this uh, review, and yeah. you the, saw oh, it and yeah. loved it. Marilyn Haggerty uh, wrote uh, from the North uh, Fork, uh, I'm sorry, Grand Forks, uh, North Dakota uh, Press, uh, wrote an, a, a small article, a review of the new Olive Garden opening up in her neighborhood. And of course, it, it became sort of an immediate viral sensation. Yeah. People were putting it up as the most hilarious and mockable review ever. Um, and, and of course, that was my first instinct as a New Yorker, as somebody who's eaten all over the world, to sneer. And then uh, her reaction uh, was, was, I don't know, so dignified and, and genuine, and the, the, uh, genuine and, yeah. and the review itself was so heartfelt. And this is a woman who's been reporting for the paper five columns, I think, for 30 years. I thought, wow, she's making us all look bad. This is the way much of America eats. And I, I just thought, actually, this body of work, these 30 years of reviews of, of dining in North Dakota is, in a sense, a, a, a history of dining in America. And I thought, I, I want to publish this person. And uh -huh. in fact, I will be doing just that. So you guys are going to work together with a book deal. Very uh, nice. Yes. I'm meeting with her later today. Very nice.
After the Anthony Bourdain co-sign, Marilyn became less of a target of online mockery and more of a beloved living meme that the mainstream media couldn't get enough of. Marilyn's book would go on to sell thousands of copies and she continues to write reviews for the Grand Forks Herald to this day. Looking back, she is very grateful for all the attention and opportunities granted to her by this Olive Garden review. And she is most grateful for what Anthony Bourdain did. Shortly after Anthony's passing in 2018, she had this to say about his upstanding character. He spoke up for me at a time when people all over the country were making great fun of the column I write. To have a man of his stature to rise up and befriend me, it meant a lot to me. You know, sometimes you go through life and you think about all the wonderful things that happened to you. And one of the wonderful things that happened to me was when Anthony Bourdain spoke up for me and wanted to publish my columns in a book. And in regards to his death, she said, it's sad, shocking news. After experiencing the loss of his longtime fishing buddy, an elderly gentleman takes to a Craigslist-like website to ask the internet if anyone wants to be his fishing partner. Likely not expecting much of a response, the lonely fisherman soon finds himself receiving hundreds of offers, and what happens next will bring a tear to your eye. This is the touching story of the internet's loneliest fisherman. Our story begins in early January of 2017 with this older gentleman from Lewiston, South Australia. Ray Johnston, and I know it looks like John Stone for you American viewers, but it's pronounced Johnston in the Australian dialect. 75-year-old Mr. Ray Johnston was a retired workman who was living off of his pension. His wife had passed away years prior, and the man spent a lot of time alone in his house in this semi-rural area. One can imagine that such a lifestyle could attract a feeling of loneliness, and well, according to a post posted by Ray to Gumtree.com on January 19th, it seemed like Ray was experiencing such an emotion, or at the very least a feeling of boredom. For those who don't know, Gumtree.com is basically Craigslist, and under Gumtree's fishing gear and equipment section, Mr. Ray submits this post titled, My name is Ray Johnston, looking for a fishing mate. He categorizes the listing as used. My name is Ray Johnston, Australian. I'm a widowed pensioner who is looking for a fishing mate. My previous fishing mate is now deceased. I am a land-based fisherman. I have all the gear for all types of fish that is required for land-based fishing. What I want is a fishing mate in a similar position to myself who also wants someone to go fishing with. I am willing to share all costs, petrol, bait, and should you happen to own a boat, willing to pay all ramp fees, but happy if you are also a land-based fisherman. Contact me at my email address or phone me to arrange a meeting to see if we could get along with each other. Thanking you, Ray Johnston. P.S. I live at Lewiston, South Australia. In addition to including a photo of himself, he also includes several photos of some of his favorite fishing spots. Needless to say, this man's post was very frank. He was being upfront and honest with the internet that he wanted some companionship. This is by no means a sob story, but it does invoke sympathy for the guy. It painted a picture of a lonely old timer with cabin fever who wanted nothing more than to get out of the house and enjoy a day by the water, participating in one of his favorite pastimes. Sure, he could possibly go fishing alone, but this is an older guy that might not be able to get around as well, and everybody knows a buddy makes everything better. Perhaps some of you have experienced something like this, you know, having a passion for a particular hobby or activity, but no one to share the love of that passion with. It can be spiritually devastating over time. Now, generally speaking, the internet has a soft spot for older folks online. A lot of real world values get lost in translation online, but respecting your elders still seems to be present on the internet. And with that said, this simple plea for a fishing pal quickly started getting attention on Gumtree and would later spread to other areas of the internet that allowed for comments and discussion. And one thing soon became clear. Thousands online were willing to be Ray's fishing pal and they were behind him all the way. Just spent the last 20 minutes crying over a wee old man's post on Gumtree looking for a fishing buddy. I love this. Let's find Ray a fisher friend. I know nothing about fishing, but hashtag I'll fish with Ray. 
literally crying about this. Someone go fishing with him. Hey, Ray, if you're ever in Canada, I'll gladly fish for largemouth or pike and pickerel with you. My treat. Hashtag I'll fish with Ray. Hashtag I'll fish with Ray. Ray, I'll take you out on my boat to catch redfish if you come to Louisiana. This now viral gum tree post that contained Ray's email and phone number was rapidly spreading around the internet resulting in him getting hundreds of calls and emails. None would actually promise Ray to go down to South Australia and fish with him, but many would give him their kind words and wished him the best of luck on his fishing buddy quest. When I started get, getting a few, few phone calls this morning, I, I thought it was just because of the age. This is something I never ever ex expected. And you've made some good mates through fishing? No, but it sounds like I will be. Support for Ray was everywhere. People were even creating GoFundMes for Ray with the hopes of getting him an expensive fishing charter and nice gear, one of which actually raised over 2,000 Australian dollars, which was paid to Ray by check according to the fund manager. Yeah, so people were offering their kind words, invitations from halfway around the world, and of course, money, but no one had satisfied what the Gumtree.com classified ad was asking for. A fishing buddy, just someone to go down there and go fishing with him. It didn't seem like anyone was truly committed to setting up a trip. Though after several weeks of many empty promises from people online, one man would finally step up and give Ray Johnston the fishing trip he'd longed for since his old fishing buddy had tragically passed away years prior. This is Matty Batsalinas. This at the time 22 year old carpenter and fishing enthusiast from Brisbane reached out to Ray after discovering his classified ad. After speaking over the phone, the two would form a friendship and worked out a trip. And Marty flew Mr. Johnston hundreds of miles out to the Queensland coast. It was a two day tour of Stradbroke Island and was likely one of the most memorable fishing experiences of Ray's angling career. After the trip, Ray and his family were extremely grateful for the act of kindness, and reflecting on the event, Daily Mail reports Matty had this to say. The weather was perfect for their outing, and he said it was incredible to see the elderly man smile. Since Matty wasn't retired himself and indeed lived hundreds of miles away from Ray, he couldn't truly be the permanent replacement fishing buddy that the classified ad was asking for. But needless to say, what he did was truly a touching gesture and likely gave the man hope and optimism that's often fleeting in one's later years. The publicity from this trip got the attention of other anglers who would go on to take Ray on different fishing trips. It seemed like he had a roster of fishermen waiting in the wings to take him out on a boat for a trip. Whatever the case, if Ray Johnston was ever in need of a fishing buddy again, the internet would be right behind him, ready to cast the line. When a man finds himself in dire need of a liver transplant, his family creates a GoFundMe on his behalf to raise the money. However, what the family didn't expect was that a satirical meme group on Facebook would discover this GoFundMe and turn the man in need of a transplant into a living meme. In one of the most bizarrely wholesome crowdfunding events in internet history, this is the story of Gary's liver transplant. Generally speaking, the internet is a pretty hostile place. 99% of the time, folks online don't have anything nice to say. And when it comes to you guys, you're always reminding me of how I'm going bald and saying that I'm wearing red lipstick, which I promise you I'm not, but I do look weird. I'll agree with you on that. Look at the top of his head. Bruh, 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 bruh. 
Now my personal gripes aside, what keeps me coming back to the internet are these rare precious moments where a group of internet oddballs will come together and perpetrate some extremely wholesome act that's both simultaneously heartwarming and hilarious. One of these moments happened recently when a Facebook group consisting of rascally trolls learned of a Facebook market post where a man was selling all of his power tools in a desperate attempt to raise money to fund a liver transplant that he would need to survive. Saddened by the dire circumstances facing this man, this troll group would temporarily pivot from their mischievous ways and work together to try to make this liver transplant a reality. This is the story of the Facebook meme page that helped a man out with getting a new liver. To set the stage for this wholesome tale, we must first enter the wild world of Facebook. Facebook is a platform that's often panned by millennials as being this irrelevant website that no one actually uses. But boomers love this place and actually update their timelines very frequently these days. And while a majority of your daily timeline updaters tend to be up in age, younger, more meme savvy internet users still flock to the site for its robust selection of dank meme community pages. Now one of these bustling millennial and Gen Z filled Facebook communities is a boomer satire slash role playing group known as a car club where everyone acts like boomers. This group and their actions will be the focus of today's story. Now this group's name sort of spells out what they do, but basically these guys look for cringe or ridiculous Facebook posts uploaded by boomers, then they share these posts to their group and well the group members go in the comments and act like boomers themselves sort of making fun of the posts. Here's an example of their work. Some guy on the page found this half naked boomer cranking his hog on the highway and shared the sighting to the car club. The community members were responded accordingly. I could crank my hog to that. He's gonna get real hurt when he rides over those goddamn grass clippings. Goddamn millennials don't understand I drank from the hose. I don't need no gear. My grandson told me you only YOLO once. I don't know what that means, but God bless. That's pretty much the community in a nutshell. They find weird boomer posts, act like boomers in the comments, satirically supporting it, but actually almost like unironically supporting it in a weird way. Normally it's all jokes with these guys, but in May of 2021, they would stumble across a boomer post that instead of drawing ridicule, caused some serious positive action to come from this group. In May, Pennsylvanian Facebook user Gary Ryder posted this to the Facebook marketplace. Air compressor towards liver transplant. Older air compressor, working as it should. I need a liver transplant, proceeds go towards it. Gary, and he gives his phone number. Okay. A Facebook user who happened to be in the car club noticed Gary's post and shared it to the page. And instead of the typical peanut gallery antics, members of the club seemed genuinely concerned for this Gary Ryder fellow and wanted to know more about his need for a liver transplant. And it turns out the man was in a pretty tough spot. Gary, 57 years old at the time of the post, had been disabled since the late 2000s after the right side of his body was crushed by a bobcat loader at his welding job. He was hospitalized for some time and it took him two years to be able to walk again, requiring supportive devices to do so. The injury left Gary with long-term chronic pain that he would take pain medication in order to manage. Eventually, Gary's health would decline further when he developed hepatic fibrosis, a condition where the liver's ability to metabolize and filter is inhibited by a buildup of excessive connective tissue and scarring. In a statement to Jalopnik.com, Gary said he was told the condition developed as a result of him passively inhaling toxic welding fumes over time at his job, also stating that his pain medications may have exacerbated the condition as well. Regardless, the bottom line was doctors told Gary he was going to need a new liver, and his family didn't have the money for this liver transplant, hence why he was selling this air compressor on Facebook Marketplace. Now the usual unserious and trollish folks over in the car club that act like boomers, they were genuinely saddened by Gary's predicament and wanted to help him out. It would be a cold day in hell before these guys let a man sell his air compressor just so he could survive. They wanted to make it easier for him. So they got to work looking for ways to help, and not long after, it would be discovered that Gary Ryder's daughter had created a GoFundMe page in the hopes of raising funding for Gary's transplant. Help Gary Ryder get a new liver. We are trying to raise money to help our father pay for a liver transplant. 
He's a caring guy who helps everyone he can. The GoFundMe was started back in March and had practically no donations, but that would change in short time. After this GoFundMe was discovered by the car club, they started leaving donation after donation in the hopes of leaving this man with some life-saving cash. And of course, they left a plethora of messages role-playing as car enthusiast boomers while doing it. Get yourself a souped-up liver, Gary. God bless you. Keep that compressor singing. God bless. God bless you, Gary. Just saw the pic of your compressor. Very fancy. Keep that darn thing and get yourself a new liver. God bless. Hell yeah, brother. We'll have that hog cranked again in no time. God bless. Keep on trucking, brother. God bless. Give them hell, Gary. Here's to you and your fam. Gary, you've got the support of some bad to the bone truckers who give no dams and shits. God bless and keep on trucking. Hell yeah, brother. You keep that air compressor and go get that transplant. And these guys just kept it up. Over the span of about a week, the people from the car club where everyone acts like boomers had managed to raise an eye-popping $58,056 for Gary's medical bills. And the only reason that the amount isn't any higher is because Gary had his daughter shut down the GoFundMe because he felt the amount raised was more than he needed. NPR has reported that Gary's transplant would cost around 40,000, meaning 58K would certainly do the trick. After the massive donation wave and donations were disabled from the GoFundMe, Adriana had this to say in regards to the support shown towards her dad. So dad has requested that donations be shut off because he has raised more than what he needed and feels grateful to everyone who has donated and made him reach his goal. So the donations have been turned off as of tonight. Thank you from my dad and us kids to everyone that has donated. You have helped give my dad more memories with our family, and we greatly appreciate every single one of you. God bless. Gary, on the other hand, had a more humorous response to all the hubbub surrounding his liver. He says, as of now, this is the best air compressor on earth. I love y'all for your support. Needless to say, Gary didn't have to sell his air compressor, which was a big W for everyone involved. That said, Gary isn't out of the woods just yet. While he does have this money now, he still doesn't have a donor for the transplant. According to updates from Adriana and Gary himself, there are multiple people from Gary's family that are being tested as potential donors coming up in the month of July. It is possible that doctors could find a match and essentially be able to transplant a graft of liver tissue from a healthy person to Gary. And if successful, the transplanted healthy tissue would help get things back running smoothly again. But if that doesn't work, Gary will most likely need to get a full liver transplant from a deceased donor, which is a bit more difficult to come by and is obviously much more of an undertaking. So only half the battle has been won now and the other half will indeed be a challenge. Yes, it's good that Gary has this life-saving cash on hand, but he's still got a ways to go. If you guys wanna keep tabs on Gary's liver transplant progress, follow the Help Gary Get a Liver Facebook page. The link is in the description. You'll find that Gary and his family post updates here, and if you're invested in this story, definitely check out the page. I wish Gary and his family the best of luck. But that was the story of how a Facebook community known for picking on boomers actually came together and rallied behind a boomer who was in a tough spot. Literally providing life-saving cash that could fund a liver transplant once a match has been found for this man. So to the folks in the car club where everyone acts like boomers, I salute you and God bless. When a high school student finds himself unfairly and unceremoniously banned from prom, the internet comes to his defense. This is the story of the James Tate prom ban. The story begins with James Tate and two other friends sneaking onto school property in the dead of night. Using a ladder and a collection of cardboard letters that James had arduously cut out himself, he adonishes the exterior wall of the school with his prom proposal to his friend Sonali. The group works quick and leaves school property, returning around 7 a.m. for the start of the school day. And naturally, when students start arriving, they're impressed with the boldness of the proposal, and this thing kind of just came across as a hilarious prank in the same vein. People respected James for doing this. James became the man of the hour, and even more impressed was Sonali, who promptly accepted his prom proposal. James got his date locked in. 
The students loved this thing, but the school's administration and headmaster Beth Smith, uh, they were kind of pissed about it. Shortly after the school day began, James and his two accomplices were called to the office and after some review of the situation, all three were issued a one day in school suspension for trespassing and defacing school property. But at the time, James wasn't worried about some one day in school suspension. He was the big man on campus and got his prom date locked in. Who cares about a one day ISS? That was until the school's headmaster turned the tables and completely shadow realmed James's hopes of going to prom. Citing some arbitrary rule created by the school system, any student suspended after the date of April 1st would automatically be forbidden to attend that year's prom. And since James did his proposal in early May, he was gonna be banned and he was totally screwed. Whispers of James's prom ban spread around the school and students who had come to revere him over the course of the day thanks to his proposal, well, they were quickly outraged by this newsflash. Students felt like the punishment didn't fit the crime here. At worst, it was a harmless prank, and at best, well, this was a pretty creative and romantic gesture towards Sonali. So in an act of protest, the students staged an in-school sit-in. They shared what had happened to Twitter and created a Facebook group. And this Facebook group would wind up going viral, amassing hundreds of thousands of followers, becoming the impromptu headquarters for James Tate supporters and people who wanted this prom ban reversed. The school's administration was well aware of the unrest that the decision caused, but felt as if it would die down shortly because, well, you know, students can only do so much. But what they underestimated was the power of social media and this story spreading around the world and potentially going viral, which it did. And eventually it would land in the hands of the mainstream media. Coons James Tate has been banned from the Shelton High School prom because of the way he asked his date to go to the big dance. Everybody seems to have an opinion on this story. He got the girl, but guess what? Not the prom. James Tate put up these letters on the entrance of his Connecticut high school asking his friend to prom. She said yes, but the school said nope. And News 8 is, of course, following the latest developments this morning as the public outcry grows for Shelton schools to let James Tate go to the prom. News 8's Kent Pierce is watching this uh, outcry grow. You just have to watch the Facebook page to see that, huh? Yeah, the Facebook page, they've gotten uh, about 500 more people liking it just in the past hour. And then... Within 48 hours, James's prom ban became a national headline, and it seemed like everyone was on James's side. Despite the mounting pressure both online and offline to reverse this ban, Headmaster Smith wasn't budging. In fact, she would actually go on a televised press conference and double down on the decision. Shelton High School is a learning community where students are expected to meet high academic and behavioral expectations. There has been a practice at Shelton High School for many years that students receiving an in-school or out-of-school suspension after April 1st for any reason would not be allowed to attend the prom. This regulation is reinforced over the course of the spring by daily PA announcements, posted signage in common areas of the building and in classrooms, as well as informational letters and automated phone messages to parents. These communications are intended to remind our students and parents of the high school expectations and consequences. James was understandably upset by the school's hardline stance on his prom ban, and on many occasions he would be invited to speak publicly on the matter in interviews. And you really can't help but feel bad for the guy as he seems like such a chill dude and really just had his best intentions at heart. Tate says he had hoped for a compromise, but is not surprised by the decision. I don't think they would gain anything if uh, they caved at this point. Uh, I think it was the um, best decision they could have made. Um, today, you heard about, obviously, what the headmaster had said. She read from a brief statement, but basically, long story short, she kept stood firm and said that her decision is what it is, and it's not changing. What was your reaction to that when you heard? Um, it seems it seems right. Er I expected. Uh, I feel like at this point they would gain nothing by uh, caving in. Um, but obviously I was disappointed. But my react, my feelings still haven't changed because the outcome hasn't changed. The headmaster wasn't budging, but this fight wasn't over. As it seemed like as every day passed, James would get more and more support. 
Popular figureheads and celebrities would come out of the woodwork to support him. He was on Jimmy Kimmel, and there were professional athletes who were once alumni of Shelton High who would speak out in support of James Tate. It seemed like everyone was on Team Tate and nobody was on Team Smith here. I think it's really important to stand up against this ridiculous administration decision. I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense. So anyways, we're all on your side. Hopefully you guys work everything out. Tate, I support you. I appreciate the fact that you didn't ask her to prom over text like most of your friends probably did. I thought it was nice. And I don't want you to take this and as like a as a bad experience, I, I I think what you did was nice. And who knows? Maybe your headmistress, her heart made out of ice, will melt. Maybe you'll be able to go to prom. Eventually, calls for this prom ban reversal got so loud that they reached government officials for the state of Connecticut. And this is where you would actually see a glimmer of hope for James Tate here. You, you can't make this shit up. Connecticut Congressman Jason Perillo and Sean Williams had been following the James Tate prom ban story since it broke in early May, and they had had many of their constituents writing and calling into their offices requesting them to do something to reverse the ban. So they actually did. On May 13th, these two congressmen announced that they were working on drafting an amendment that specifically would prevent schools in the district from banning students from prom for a suspension occurring in the last month of the school year, instead giving schools the option to issue community service instead of a ban. So essentially, this was an entire amendment to a bill that specifically covered this situation that these two congressmen were writing at the time of this going down. And once the news came out that these two congressmen were on the case, Headmaster Smith finally folded. In a televised briefing, she announced that James Tate's ban would be reversed. I have considered the effect that this incident has had on the individual student, on the entire student body and my staff, and the community. In an effort to maintain a focus on teaching and learning, I have decided to implement alternate consequences on a case-by-case -case basis, beginning with James Tate, and for other students who received internal suspension after April 1st, which would then permit some to attend the Shelton High School prom. The impossible had been done. The James Tate supporters had gotten Headmaster Smith to reverse her ban. And this seemed like an impossible feat because getting school administration to reverse a punishment decision is just something that you don't hear of in high school systems. In an ironic twist of fate, the once prom banned James Tate was given impromptu prom king status by fellow classmates. And James and Sonali finally got to enjoy their prom together. The event was on June 4th. It was Hawaiian theme and all rejoiced. Tonight's theme, a night in Hawaiian paradise. This room is just waiting to explode. James and Sonali will sit at table 50 and enjoy prime rib. They came out of the limo. They're a sharp looking couple, but that's all you're gonna get. James and Sonali have decided not to do any more media interviews. They're inside enjoying their prom, having a night to remember, and they certainly will for a long time to come. When a disabled gaming YouTuber finds himself in a tough spot, he turns to the few hundred viewers of his channel to ask for support in buying a new wheelchair van. Eventually, Reddit would stumble across the plight of the troubled gamer, and the events that follow can only be described as miraculous. To begin, allow me to introduce the protagonist of today's story, Kevin Breitenbach. My channel is about like retro gaming, like from NES to, I guess, PS2, I'm not gonna put Wii in there because that's not retro. But. Kevin is a YouTuber hailing from Cincinnati, Ohio. He's an avid gamer with a keen interest in retro handhelds, hence the name of his YouTube channel, Handheld Game Fan, which he started over 13 years ago. Whatever obscure handheld game you can think of, there's a pretty good chance that Kevin has reviewed it on his channel. My man's been at this for a long time. Hey YouTube, this is Sonic 2. This is Mega Man 3. Super Street Fighter 2 is 101 pound reasons. Mortal Kombat. Making friends in this game sucks. The Flintstones. The X-Men. Subscribe and 
Stay tuned for videos. Needless to say, this is Kevin's passion. He genuinely enjoys sharing these obscure handhelds with a few online strangers who care to tune in. It's a way for him to socialize and express himself, something that he's not able to do as effectively in the real world. As mentioned in the introduction, Kevin suffers from cerebral palsy, a neurological disorder that not only affects his speech, but the motor ability of his legs. This has left Kevin unable to walk and wheelchair bound. As a result of this, Kevin lives with family and is dependent on them and his wife Stephanie financially and for many of his activities of daily living. This obviously poses a variety of challenges, especially in regard to experiencing the outside world, you know, touching grass as they say. But Kevin's loving wife Stephanie has always been diligent about getting him out of the house, allowing him to socialize with others with the help of what will become the focal point of this story, their wheelchair accessible van. Using their van, Stephanie and Kevin would go to malls, flea markets, and other various social gatherings. It was Kevin's portal to the outside world. <laughs> that portal would be unfortunately closed. On May 26th of 2017, Kevin would upload an uncharacteristically depressing video to his YouTube channel, informing viewers that his wheelchair accessible van, well, it had broken down, essentially trapping him in his home. Apparently, the family's financial situation at the time was tight between Stephanie's nursing home job and Kevin's parents' finances already being spread thin for medical bills. There was no money available to repair the van. I'll survive, but... It's really tough on both of us. I'm trapped, I'm, I can't do what I want. And I really don't want to ask, but if you guys could really help out, it'd be really great. I mean, I don't, I, we don't know what else to do. I mean, I mean, this is like a highest resort thing here, so. So we, we really don't want to do this, but kind of need to, but thanks for watching guys. His video was a humble request, asking fans to chip in to a GoFundMe page created for his family, in the hopes that with a bit of extra cash, they could find some kind of travel solution for Kevin. Now, one might imagine a channel with just over 1,000 subscribers and videos only cracking about 100 views that this plea for help would fall on deaf ears. But oddly enough, that's not what happened. These fans truly were dedicated, and in a matter of about a week or so, they raised $1,000 for him. Update video here on um, how the GoFundMe is going. Um, it's going really well. Which I'm really surprised. It's really nice to know that people around the world are willing to help me out. I just wanted to thank you guys for all the support we've been getting. It's hard. It's hard on me, especially. I, because I don't have my independence. That's what it feels like. So like I said, thanks guys. Everybody that supported me means a lot. Love you guys. Thanks a lot. This $1,000 by itself is extremely impressive, but nobody could have predicted what would happen next. On June 13th of 2017, a Redditor named Sean Titus would share a video from Kevin's handheld game YouTube channel where he discussed the wheelchair van dilemma. And the plight of this stranded wheelchair bound gamer seemed to emotionally resonate with the Reddit community. Hate to see genuine people down on their luck. Just donated $100. Thanks for the heads up, OP. Can we get the link to donate? Fuck yeah! Let's help this guy! Almost immediately, folks became galvanized behind the cause. They wanted to help this dude out. The post on our videos exploded, eventually making it to the front page of Reddit. And when something makes it to the front page, you're talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people stumbling upon this request to fix this guy's wheelchair van. Needless to say, the GoFundMe reacted accordingly. Wait, what? What? Wait, are you wait wait, are you serious? They said it's at five thousand forty. No. Fuck you. That's what they what? did. Somebody just said it's at oh, We're at five thousand forty! That's freaking crazy! <gasps> oh my god. Oh my god. I don't wanna get another shot camera, but Jesus. Some somebody gave eight hundred dollars. Who? Oh. Whoever Lucas Stalker is. Somebody donated $800. Yeah, I got that. Oh, that's fucking sad. Oh my god. 
Oh. There's one that's at it. There's one that's at it. Gonna oh my god. Oh my god, guys. What's Desi gonna do? I don't know, man. Oh, the sport. Lucas, thank you so much for that donation. It means a lot to me. I can't believe you did that. In total, nearly $49,000 was raised thanks to the thousands of Reddit benefactors that participated. And Kevin, to say the least, was blown away by all the support. So now that the funds were in order, it's time to fix up that wheelchair van and get Kevin back on the road. Well, this is when a Redditor who just so happens to be a mechanic named Triton V8 guy steps up to the plate. Triton worked for a car dealership in Ohio, about five hours away from where Kevin lived. He happened to stumble upon the post detail Detailing Kevin's van situation when it was on Reddit's front page. Well, Triton V8 guy, he actually offers to fix the van for free. And the dude wasn't just blowing smoke up people's asses, he actually did it. Triton would drive to Kevin's house, pick up the van, take it to his shop, and follow through with his promise. And by the summer, this legendary wheelchair accessible van was back on the road. Kevin was once again a free man. And you can really just tell how much all of this meant to him. We're gonna be able to do so much stuff that we never would ever be able to afford ever. It's I it's it's crazy. I I'm laughing because I'm so freaking excited. Now, needless to say, this event was quite the wholesome endeavor. Thousands of anonymous strangers coming together to help someone less fortunate. He was a YouTuber who had dedicated nearly nine years of his life at the time to reviewing games for a virtually non-existent audience. He was a disabled person who, despite his unfortunate circumstances, always seemed to have a positive outlook on life. Kevin was a guy that simply needed a break, and the internet was kind enough to give him one. One can only hope that a similar series of events plays out in the future for someone else in need. I just want to say thank you to everybody. I, 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 don't, I don't even know how many people to thank. There's so many people. So you might be asking, since the van was repaired for free, what happened to all of the GoFundMe donation money? After corresponding with Kevin for this video, he tells me that the money went to a variety of sources, all of which benefited him and the family directly. Some went towards purchasing a state-of-the-art portable power chair, which would allow Kevin to easily travel in non-wheelchair equipped vehicles, as the chair could now be stowed in practically any vehicle's trunk. This would come in handy as unfortunately the wheelchair accessible van would break down again and pretty much reach the end of its lifespan, and they didn't have enough money to outright buy a brand new van. So what they did make sense, why not take the more resourceful option and just get a wheelchair that works with any car? Other money went to pay for old medical bills accrued by Kevin and his brother. A braille note taker device was also purchased for Kevin's brother. While the old van is no more, Kevin assured me that him and his wife have transport. They were able to purchase an SUV, which can easily be traveled in thanks to that portable power chair. Oh, and he also bought a Nintendo Switch with some of that money, but... I don't think the donators will mind too much. Hell, he plays games on it for his channel anyways. There's the switch, the neon switch. And speaking of his channel, Kevin continues to upload videos to the Handheld Game Review channel to this day. Feel free to check out his channel. The link is in the description box. And to wrap things up here, I have an exclusive video I'd like to show you sent to me from Kevin. In it, he reflects on this whole situation and provides a big life update that you can't miss. Check it out. Okay, Wavy, so here's the uh, update for all the people that help support the, uh, sorry, my wife was in the <laughs> shot there. The uh, GoFundMe, uh, what, five years ago? Uh, but actually the van that you guys helped fix is now gone. We don't have that anymore. It just kept breaking down after it got fixed. Uh, but other than that, the only other big thing we have to really talk about is uh, actually has to do with uh, my wife and I. Uh, we're actually going to have a baby <laughs> here soon, so, um, yeah, that's the other big news we have. Um, other than that, 
just to everybody out there, I, we really do appreciate all the support we did get back then and still do now, even on my YouTube channel, which if you guys want to check me out, I'm sure Wavy's going to have a shout out in there somewhere. Um, but I'll, I'm also on Patreon. I'm sure a lot of you guys know that. If you want to support my channel, uh, it's only a dollar a month. You, you guys know how Patreon works. And if you want to um, keep up to date with what my wife and I are doing, uh, you can always follow me on Facebook and Twitter and my YouTube channel as well. Uh, because I still post on there, even though it's been a while. But now you guys know why. If you guys already do follow me, that's why. Because I've been focused on uh, the baby and stuff like that. So um, there you go. Anyway, uh, thank you, Wavy. And I hope uh, this video was good enough for you. Because I don't know what else to say. So <laughs> hopefully it's good enough. Thanks again, dude. Your vids are awesome. Like I, lo I love your channel. Um, yeah, it's huge, huge deal for me to be on the, on your channel. So <laughs> thanks so much, man. Really appreciate it. Peace out, guys. Iridocyclitis. <laughs> Iridocyclitis has become an iconic meme over the years, with the young man featured in the meme being mocked for his strange appearance and voice. But there's really more than what meets the eye here, because behind this meme lies an inspiring story of self-improvement and humility. From spelling bee champion to living meme icon, this is the story of Iridocyclitis kid Dev Jaswal. Dev Jaswal is from the town of Louisville, Mississippi. The town has a small population, just over 6,600 people, and is about as unremarkable as any other small town in the American South. Aside from producing a handful of semi-notable college sports coaches, this place isn't known for much. But that would change in the early 2010s when the Indian American Jaswal family began to bring accolades to this humble town with their children's academic accomplishments. Anachronism. Anachronism. A-N-A-C-H-R-O-N-I-S-M. Anachronism. Congratulations. Yeah, 2010 Mississippi State Spelling Bee Champion. And let's give it up for our second place. In 2010, Dev's sister, an avid speller, would make it to the Scripps National Spelling Bee, a Louisville first. Unfortunately, she didn't win and aged out of competition. Eighth grade is the limit. But hope wasn't lost as her younger brother, Dev, would pick up the Jace Wall Spelling Bee mantle. Inspired by his sister, Dev would begin entering spelling bees in the fifth grade, and he actually caught the attention of his entire state when he made it to the 2012 Mississippi State Spelling Bee and won. He successfully spelled the championship word, Mordacious, after a hard-fought gauntlet against other competitors several years older than him. Winning a state spelling bee qualifies a person to enter the prestigious National Scripps Spelling Bee in Washington, D.C. This is a big deal for Dev's case in particular because in the 93-year history of Scripps Spelling Bees, Mississippi has yet to have one representative take the championship. With Dev's help, perhaps this would be the year that Louisville would bring home the gold. In May of 2012, Dev was sent to Washington, D.C. to participate in his first National B. There were 278 contestants and over $30,000 was on the line. There's little footage archived from this event, but there does exist a clip online that shows Dev speaking after completing round one of the B, a round that requires individuals to take a written test spelling a series of words. When was that moment for you when you were finally able to... <sighs> After I finished taking that test, yeah. have the, the round one test, it was so long and it was so hard that when I was finally done, I was like, oh, I can finally get out. So now you got a smile yeah. on your face. Yeah. And you're probably a little bit more relaxed. Mm -hmm. I was very tense in the yeah. room. In the beginning, it was really hard, and then I thought I wasn't going to do it at all. And then. Through the middle, I thought, okay, I'll do, I'll do fine, because it got easier. And then at the end, it got very hard again, so I'm like, I don't know at all what, <laughs> how it's going to be. So it got hard, then it got easy, then it got hard again. After the written test, Dev would make it through round two of the Scripps National by successfully spelling the word idiopathic. He then makes it and passes through the third round by correctly spelling the word Qatari. 
Points gained in these rounds would be added to the score that Dev made in his written test, and this is where we start getting into some unfortunate revelations. If contestants had a total sum of 23 correct spellings, they would be admitted into the semifinals. Well, unfortunately, Dev wouldn't make the cut. He says this on Twitter. Unfortunately, I am not advancing to the semis. I spelled 17 out of 31 correctly. 23 would advance you. Good luck to all the semifinalists. Dev was out of the competition, but he wasn't discouraged. Determined to get another shot at the National B, Dev begins to enter the State Bs again. After struggling on the local level in 2013 and 2014, Dev finally caught a break as an 8th grader in 2015, where he won the Mississippi State B by successfully spelling the word Eliatic, once again qualifying him for the national competition. Eliatic. E. L-E-A-T-I-C, Eliatic. I'm really, really happy right now and really, really glad that all my hard work paid off. And when did you win before? I won in 2012 when I was a fifth grader. I'm extremely proud and yeah, so excited. <laughs> and you helped him out a little bit with it too. A little bit. Whenever I was home, I tried to quiz him when I could, um, but he did most of the work himself, so I'm very, very proud of that. So Dev is now preparing for the National B, and in the few years since the previous one, he had learned some strategies and a lot of wisdom in regard to spelling words that he had never previously encountered. In this interview, he shares some tricks of the trade. Last word, this word I've never ever ever seen before. Eliatic. And I have the definition again. Of or relating to a school of Greek philosophers who principally asserted the unity of... And when he told me it was like a school of philosophy and it was Greek, I can't, Greek has certain ways they would put letters together. I just kind of use rules in my head that I could remember. It's not just about memorizing completely everything. It's about learning why those letters are put together and why it's spelled the way it is and what other words relate to those words. On May 24th of 2015, Dev was sent to Washington, D.C. to compete with 283 of the United States' best spellers for the 38,000 grand prize and the prestige that comes along with being crowned Scripps B Champion. This spelling bee would prove to be one of the most difficult challenges Dev had faced in his life, and the competition was fierce, the words were brutal. Sharon Schnitter. Sharon Schnitter. Shit. In the later rounds, competitors were dropping like flies, and Dev was almost one of these flies. But thanks to the skills picked up throughout his spelling career, he managed to stay in the fight thanks to a clutch spelling of the word Bacchaeus. 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 May I have the definition, please? Bacchaeus or Bacchaeus is a metrical foot of three syllables, the first short, the other two long. May I have the language of origin? It's from Latin, which formed it from a Greek word. Um, can you use it in a sentence? Rumor has it that Drake's next mixtape contains a rap in which every verse begins and ends with a bacchaeus. He didn't ask for part of speech, but it should have been clear from the definition. That should clarify the ending of the word. The middle of this word could be sticky, unless he recognizes the Greek name from mythology. Bacchaeus. B. A. C. C H I U S Bacchaeus. Correct. <laughs> Thank you. With that correct spelling, Dev found himself in the last batch of 49 competitors, and the words in this round, to say the least, were extreme. Bacchaeus is just a small sampling from the basket of abominations the coordinators of this event call words. Here are some other examples. You've got commissurotomy, hypocrypiform, cytopoesis, and uh, sporagiful? Yeah, we'll, we'll count that. And of course, you can't have a discussion about challenging words from the 2015 Scripps National B without mentioning the word that would inadvertently make Dev Jaiswal a living meme. Iridocyclitis. What the hell is iridocyclitis? Iridocyclitis is an eye condition in which your iris and the ciliary body become inflamed or swollen. 
Does that mean anything to you? Well, here's a photo of it. Oh! Iridocyclitis is by no means a word that finds itself in the lexicon of an everyday person. But thanks to the viral mechanism of Vine, this word would be ingrained in anybody interested in meme culture. And it was also the word that doomed Dev Jaiswal's chances of winning the 2015 Scripps National B. Iridocyclitis. I R I D O C I C-L-I-T-I-S, iridocyclitis. Iridocyclitis is spelled I-R-I-D-O-C-Y-C-L-I-T-I-S. Iridocyclitis knocked Dev out at fourth place, but he would take his loss gracefully. After making it this far and losing, one might expect Dev to well up in tears and dejectedly slink off stage, but that's not what happened. Thank you so much, everyone. He is such a happy kid. Just a good boy, his mom said. So now we've got a fourth place finisher, Dev Jaiswal, happy with what he accomplished on his way home. Unbeknownst to him at this time, the internet is making a mockery out of him thanks to this iridocyclitis phenomenon. Iridocyclitis. <laughs> it's hard to exactly say what makes this meme funny, but I reckon it has something to do with Dev's laser focus in the clip and of course his rather robotic uh, pronunciation of iridocyclitis. When it's shown out of context of it, you know, being in a spelling bee and all that, it, it is... It is kind of puzzling and chuckle-worthy, to say the least. Iridocyclitis. With the nature of this clip being more of a laughing at than laughing with Dev, you might imagine that becoming the butt of an internet joke would take away from the amazing experience that he just went through. But at the time, it seemed like nothing could hinder this young man's cheerful spirit. While he was now forever going to be known as the Iridocyclitis Kid, the warm welcome home from the residents of his small town of Louisville, Mississippi helped Dev realize how appreciated he really was, and how proud those who knew him personally were of him. This is the emotional reception when Dev makes it home. Who was overcome with emotion as he stepped out of his family's van. <laughs> This has been the best experience of my entire life. Thank you for all the support. This is the biggest trophy I could ever receive. The welcome home to Louisville also included a warm embrace with his father, Upendra, whom Dev had not seen in a week. I'm very proud of this kid. He's a gift from the God that I want to say thank you. We love Dev! We love Dev! We love Dev! The community here is so great, and I just want to thank everyone. Definitely all of the support I received from all of the friends and friendships I made and everything, really. I love to represent my state to the best of my ability. Imagine if we all smiled and laughed and showed the same emotion and appreciation as Dev Jaswal. The iridocyclitis meme lives on in the annals of meme history, but what about Dev himself? What became of him? Dev would never again take the stage for the Scripps National Spelling Bee, as he would age out like his sister did before him. But regardless of this, he would go on to achieve academic greatness. After high school, Dev would be admitted to the prestigious Princeton University, a world-renowned Ivy League school in New Jersey where only 6% of applicants get accepted. According to Dev's public LinkedIn profile, he's currently pursuing a bachelor's degree in psychology with a minor in journalism. Dev would also go on to serve as a spelling bee tutor for younger kids, serving as a mentor, sharing the strategies he had learned in his bee career and passing them on to others. And of course, aside from his dedication to academia, there's also the full-time job of being known as the Iridocyclitis Kid. There are a handful of photos online showing Dev posing with folks that have recognized him in public, indicating that he is a good sport about the meme. And a post from 2017 also shows that he can take a bit of a joke. That said though, he does wish more people saw the full Iridocyclitis segment where he misspells the word and then gets a round of applause by the audience and thanks them and just shows his grateful side. This is what he had to say in an interview from November of 2021. Yeah, I've always sort of felt like there are two camps of people who have seen that video. Originally, it wasn't the whole video that took off from there. 
It was just a shorter clip, which I've always been confused by because, like, personally, I don't see what's funny. I just said the word. Iridocyclitis. <laughs> he continues, I was pretty happy when the longer video took off of me as well because that was a special moment for me. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> Dev will likely continue to achieve great things in life. He's a brilliant guy, and I wish him nothing but the best. That, my friends, was the journey of Dev Jaswal, the Iridocyclitis kid, from a young speller to a living meme to a Princeton University attendee. The meme exodus is an inspiring story involving one man's dedication to a silly internet joke. Intermingling a passion for cycling with internet humor, Twitter user Ruben Lopez live posts his nearly 2,500 mile cycling trip from Poo Poo Point in Washington State to Pee Pee Creek, Ohio. This is that epic journey. This story begins with our protagonist, 24 year old musician, Twitter memester, and cycling enthusiast Ruben Lopez. So my name's Ruben. I'm primarily a musician, but I also love biking cross country. Um, I love everything about it. Ruben by trade is a session drummer and when not drumming, he's making shit posts on Twitter and crushing pumpkins between his thighs. Right. Oh my God! <laughs> now that's impressive. Ruben is also an avid cyclist, having completed several cross country trips in his time. So like I've been from like, Chicago to Orlando, I did um, Chicago to California. In the summer of 2020, Ruben was in the middle of planning for his next cycling trip, which was to be from Seattle to Chicago, but a Twitter meme post that he stumbled upon around this time inspired him to make some changes to his course. On June 20th of 2020, a Twitter user shared a post claiming that their stepdad had sent him a text message proposing that the next family road trip would be a drive from Poo Poo Point in Washington to Pee Pee Creek in Ohio. An obvious joke, right? Well, this tweet ended up going viral, amassing close to 300,000 likes, and a spark of intrigue grew amongst those in the tweet's replies. People were asking themselves, hey, what if someone actually did this poo-poo to PP Creek route? That would be pretty epic, wouldn't it? Well, Ruben, who was previously unaware of these two laughably named locations, he became inspired by this tweet and decided that he would be the one to step up to the challenge and actually make the journey from poo-poo to PP Creek on a bicycle. And then I saw uh, the poo poo pee pee trip online and I was like, oh, I gotta do that one. It just so happened that that is exactly where I wanted to go. Before beginning his adventure, Ruben shares his intent to make this trip on social media and links to a GoFundMe with a $5,000 goal intended to help raise money for Yemen's ongoing humanitarian crisis. Then of course he gets prepared for this 2,500 mile meme quest that he's about to embark on. How are you preparing for this mentally and what kind of gear are you bringing with you? Um, since I've done trips like this before, I kind of know what to expect and I'm really in touch with like, um, just like myself as a whole to be able to do something like this because you spend hours and, and days by yourself. However much you decide to spend on the gear that you tried to bring, like of course there's like essentials and stuff, but depending on how much you put into it is gonna determine how comfortable you are. What I brought was a tent, a bag of clothes. Um, you know, I have like little things like, you know, um, like flashlight, um, mm -hmm. hygiene stuff. And um, I had a, a sleeping bag um, also toward the end because it was getting cold. On August 19th, Ruben makes his way from Seattle, Washington and travels about 20 minutes southeast to the most hallowed of excrement themed trailheads. Poo Poo Point. He takes a photo to show Twitter that he means business, and shortly after, he begins his route to Pee Pee Creek, Ohio. He had a long road ahead of him, weeks of cycling in 10 states to traverse, but Ruben was determined to make meme history here, and he had a small group of supporters cheering him on that would only grow in time. Ruben's first obstacle on this trip would be an uphill battle through the Rocky Mountains. So in the beginning, it, it starts really slow. Um, it's probably like 60 to 70 miles a day, which it, it sounds like a lot, but you have, you know, from when you wake up to when you go to bed to do it, so. Cause you just, you just gotta keep moving. You just keep moving, man. You just gotta keep, you'll get somewhere if you keep moving, you feel me? So. 
but like at some point um my my Achilles tendons were uh both of them at the same time were just completely shot and I was limping on both legs until mm. I had to stop to get like um I got like some painkillers and stuff like that this view all this I love it don't get me wrong but climbing mountains on a bicycle might be the dumbest shit I've ever heard of in my life I've been doing that for like nine days now I'm currently at like above 6,000 feet in elevation and quite frankly I'm sick of it but it's all downhill from here in a good way At this point in time, he's spending at least 12 hours a day out on the road, and he needs a lot of food to keep himself going. Fortunately, according to Ruben, there's always a rotisserie chicken nearby. So as far as uh, for food, I mean, what, do you, what kind of stuff are you eating and how are you getting it? When it comes to food, I pretty much eat whatever I want um, all the time because I burn more calories than I could ever con uh, consume. I could have, yeah. Yeah, see this right here? This is every day. Every day I have at least two or three peanut butter sandwiches. I put my loaf, uh, I make it as small as I can so I can fit it in my shit. And then, uh, you know, cause it's all going down the same place. You don't need no fancy ass looking sandwich. There are days where like, I just have like um, a whole chicken for lunch and like <laughs> a whole bread. And then for dinner that night is like a whole little Caesar's pizza. After a week or so of cycling of what Ruben says was approximately 69 miles per day, he finally clears the mountains and reaches the Midwest. His cycling speed at this point improves because the terrain is flatter. And now I'm sure many of you at this point are wondering where the hell is this guy sleeping? What kind of places are you, are you sleeping for the night when you do these trips? I'm pretty much uh, like throwing my tents on the side of the road. Pretty much like it's um i find like a good bush or like somewhere that i just can't be like bothered or anything or like no one knows that i'm bothering them sleeping alone in the wild presents a number of dangers and reuben encountered his fair share during this trip in this case animals were a threat reuben had a close call with the creature of the night nearly injuring him in the process so i set my stuff up um uh, and I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with the area so um i fall asleep for like an hour I'm like, I wake up for a second and I hear this huge animal tumbling down this hill. Oh, oh shit. And it lands right next to my tent. Like if it was like a couple feet, you know, to the right, like I, it could have fallen right on top of me. And I didn't know what it was at the time. Um, and I was, I was just laying there, you know, I was super, super vulnerable position. <laughs> yeah, I was just like eyes open, um, <laughs> you know, like pounding out of my chest. Um, Cause then it starts to it starts to do like this breathing thing where it's trying to like you know see what's around it and stuff like that and it, oh, all I hear Lord. all I hear is like like right like if I stuck my hand out of the tent I could have touched it basically and I had no idea what it was um, but you can just hear like the size when it fell and like when it's breathing. What the uh, fuck was it? And uh, so, like, I, I waited. Eventually, it, like, trotted, trotted away. But I ended up looking up, like, what makes those sounds and stuff like that. And so I guess it was just a really big deer, luckily, because uh, it, it has um, that thing where it smells its surroundings to, to get familiar with it. About three weeks into this trip, Reuben finds himself in the middle of South Dakota. At this point, his pace had increased dramatically thanks to the flatter terrain, and his body was slowly becoming more conditioned to the journey after struggling beforehand in the Rockies. Determined to push forward, he was averaging close to 100 miles a day and was making good time to PP Creek. But just as he was hitting his stride, tragedy struck. In early September, a dip in Canada's polar vortex brought uncharacteristically low temperatures to the region for that time of year and persistent rain showers. One day, this rain forced Reuben to end his cycling day early, forcing him to camp out on the side of the highway without any water and he was running low on food. The rain kept him from resupplying. To make matters worse, a venomous caterpillar had found its way into his glove, causing a painful rash to spread around his hand. At this point, cold, wet, and in pain, he decides to hold up for the night and hope for better weather in the morning so he can go resupply at the nearby town of Murdo. I may not show it, but we kind of struggling out here today. All right, I draw my peanut butter. I only have bread to eat. I have half a bottle of water left. The next town is 50 miles away. 
tomorrow's gonna be colder than it is today. In the morning, the rain stops and Ruben sees his chance, so he beelines it for this nearby town. Unfortunately though, this resupply run would lead to his rock bottom moment of this entire trip. Stranded in the middle of nowhere. I get up, I, I pack my stuff, uh, and I start biking like what, like, it's probably like 15 miles away. Um, still really cold, still just nasty wind. Probably like a block before I get to the hotel, my tire pops, um, my inner tube. I only had one left <laughs> and uh, you know, I pick up some food from like the, you know, that small, you know, the small stores they got in those towns. And um, so that following day I check out, um, I set my bike up with the inner tube, with my last inner tube. For some reason, I, I don't even know what I hit. Uh, I don't know if there was like something stuck in, in the tire itself, but another block in, uh, leaving the motel, my, t my last inner tube just pops. I did it, I didn't know what to do like you know i can't i i don't know who to ask or like you know i'm just i'm just a stranger just the way that they're a stranger to me and then all of a sudden i don't know where this guy he has a bike on the back of his um truck he asks me what's wrong with with my bike because he sees that it's in pieces i took it apart so i can try to you know think of something uh whatever uh rig it up uh i told him like dude i'm i'm fresh out of inner tubes and i don't know I don't know where to go. Like the next town is however far away. He's like, I got, um, I have inner tubes, um, and uh, I'll, I'll give them to you. Um, I can't even look at him because I, I'm like, you know, <laughs> I'm kind of embarrassed. Like I'm, I'm about to start crying because he's giving me inner tubes, and I just say like, thank you. And I try to, I try to get it out without my voice cracking, and um, you know, as soon as he walks away, I'm just like crying my ass off dude but that that particular encounter was something that uh, i felt was bigger than you know chance itself you know and sometimes it just kind of plays out like that so in what had to be a case of divine intervention from the meme gods thanks to this anonymous do-gooder the poo poo to pee pee creek dream was still alive Ruben's quest would continue. So Ruben hightails it out of South Dakota and is blazing a trail eastwards through the Midwest, taking plenty of photos and videos along the way. While he didn't have any more tragic inner tube incidents, there were still the struggles pertaining to a cross-country bike trip. Every day presented a new challenge. Dude, I just had a look for my phone for like 20 minutes through a few little spiders. Look at that thing. They're all over the place too. <laughs> gotta stay strapped. <laughs> After a couple more weeks of chilly traveling through Minnesota and Wisconsin, Ruben makes it to Chicago, Illinois, where he makes a pit stop to visit some friends and family. Good morning. It's day 29. I've been out for so long. I love what I'm doing. Raising money, bringing awareness, and that's the shit. So... And from here, he's on the home stretch. Only 400 miles separate him and PP Creek. He could see the light at the end of the tunnel. He pushes through Illinois and Indiana in a matter of days and finally reaches the promised land of Ohio. He's welcomed by the rather humorously named Shartz Road. Its presence, a symbolic mimetic North Star, if you will, affirming Reuben that PP Creek is but a stone's throw away. By this point, Ruben had been cycling and braving the outdoors for 36 days. He had been virtually isolated from society the majority of this time, participating in what was likely the most mentally and physically demanding endeavor of his entire life. One can only imagine at this point in his journey the sense of blissful joy he was feeling as he pedaled along the highway knowing P.P. Creek was only a matter of miles away. But I just, I just saw what the bridge looked like, and I was like, oh, I know, I know what that sign says. You know what I mean? So I was, like, pulling up, and I was, like, shaking. Oh, man, it felt so good. It was really exciting. At approximately 4.20 p.m., Ruben rolls his battered body and bicycle up to P.P. Creek. He finally had made it and emotions took over. <laughs> Let's go! <laughs> Holy shit, oh man. Oh my god. Oof. Oh my god. Let's... Let's go! Oh. 
dude, I'm really, I'm really crying right now. <laughs> it's so stupid. It's, it's fucking Phoebe Green. Oh my god. <laughs> it's so stupid. It's, it's fucking baby green. Oh my god. Oh, it's so wholesome. The madman did it! Poggers! Feeling exhilarated about what he had just accomplished, Ruben would then share what he did to his Twitter page. And to say that people were happy for him would be an understatement. Thousands would show up in the replies of this poo poo to pee pee accomplishment. And in a short time, Ruben's tweet would receive just under 700,000 likes. Folks inspired by Ruben's poo poo to pee pee quest lined up to donate to the Yemen GoFundMe, resulting in an impressive sum of $11,466 being raised. It was a beautiful celebration for one man's dedication to a meme, and Ruben wasn't even done yet. After PP Pee Pee Creek, Ruben decided that he would continue his trek all the way to Maine so that he could make the trip a full cross-country outing. And if possible, he wanted to visit PP Island, which was nearby and possible to ferry to. After braving some chilly conditions in the northeast part of the states, Ruben would finally reach Maine in October. Unfortunately though, he was unable to get into Canada for PP Island because of COVID restrictions. Bruh. I actually wanted to go further than Maine. Um, but at the time, um, they weren't letting anyone into Canada um, oh, for COVID. Yeah. So, uh, but up there, there was PP Island and honestly, I, uh, I wanted to, I was, I was ready, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't let me. In total, Ruben had traveled just under 3,600 miles from Washington state to Maine. And he did this in 50 days all while becoming an internet legend in the process. This man truly put himself through hell, not just for the meme, but to raise a little bit of money for Yemen, to learn a bit about himself, and to push his cycling abilities to the next level. So what's in store for Ruben next? I'll let him take it from here. What's the next trip? You told me earlier you had another trip, like to top this off. Like, is this next trip gonna be your Mount Everest of uh, toilet humor trips or what's you got planned? Well, I'm, I'm gonna hold the the toilet trips off for a second, but um, the next one is gonna be uh, it's gonna be starting in San Diego, goes to Miami, um, mm. up to Boston, um, down to Las Vegas, and then to Washington. Uh, at at most thirteen thousand miles. Holy shit. Dude. Yeah, I'm probably gonna be gone for like seven months. Uh, anything you want to say to the people watching this video? Anything you want to promote uh, going forward? Yeah, um, I have this trip coming up, which I'll be posting about every single day um, for the next seven months. Um, what's today? November? Next? Yeah, November the 20th. Okay, yeah, so in about a, a month's time, I'll be heading on the road full time and just kind of living it up, so. Yeah, man, I, uh, Ruben, I won't keep you any longer, dude. Uh, I really appreciate your time and coming on and allowing me to tell your story on my channel. Absolutely, dude, thank you so much for having me. This is, this is really fun. The story of Sad Papa is a light-hearted internet tale sure to get a chuckle out of anyone. When this image of a downtrodden, burger-wielding grandpa goes viral, the Twitter community banded together in an effort to cheer the old timer up. Enjoy. Our story starts on March 16th of 2016 with retired iron industry worker, 66 year old Oklahoma resident, Kenneth Harmon. Mr. Harmon had just turned 66 years old on March 16th and to celebrate his birthday, he thought it would be fun to have his grandkids over for a good old American hamburger cookout. So Kenneth Harmon puts the word out to his grandkids telling them that he's about to whip up some of them old fashioned pawpaw patties and y'all need to come through. So he sends the word out to all of his grandkids, six of them to be exact. After a few phone calls were made, Papa would pick up some ground beef and buns and other burger supplies from the store and made sure that he had everything he needed for a solid cookout. Later that afternoon, his granddaughter Kelsey Harmon would arrive and was ready to grill out with Papa. So believing that the other five grandkids would be arriving shortly after Kelsey, 
Kelsey and Papa went ahead and started firing up the grill and threw some patties on. Because surely the grandkids will be here soon, might as well have the burgers ready for everybody to eat and have a good time. Papa would go on to grill a total of 12 patties, all of which were associated with buns, pickles, and other fixins. <laughs> However, as he was removing the final patty from the grill, Papa and Kelsey had come to the sad realization that none of the other grandkids had arrived. It seemed as though the other grandkids had bigger priorities in their life and they couldn't spend a few hours to celebrate their own grandfather's birthday. And honestly, everything that we have discussed so far with this story is pretty routine stuff. Let's admit it. There's tons of elderly people around the world that are completely neglected by their children and grandchildren. However, this situation starts getting mad crazy whenever Twitter gets involved. So after realizing that no other grandchildren would be arriving, Kelsey and Papa began eating hamburgers together. And while Papa is eating his burger, Kelsey pulls her phone out and captures one of the most iconic photos captured in internet history. This iconic sad Papa photo taken by Kelsey features him looking down with this solemn, morose expression on his face. And I could only imagine he was going through what must have been extreme disappointment and a feeling of neglect. The photo that Kelsey took of sad Papa would be uploaded to her Twitter account with the caption heard around the world. And this caption that Kelsey would post associated with this photo just made the perfect recipe for a viral tweet. Here's the caption right here. Dinner with Papa tonight. He made 12 burgers for all six grandkids and I'm the only one who showed love him. Now after dropping this tweet the two would go on to enjoy their evening together eating on burgers presumably but something would happen that completely caught Kelsey and Papa off guard. It seemed as though Kelsey's photo and tweet caption really struck a nerve with wine mom slash relatable white girl Twitter and the post would begin to go viral. People generally responded to the tweet with sympathetic posts making reference to missing their own grandparents or express their sadness for Papa in this situation. I've lost all my grandparents. If yours are still alive, show them you love them, please. Hashtag grandparents, hashtag be kind, hashtag love. Poor Papa made all them burgers for no reason. Why couldn't they just show up to Papa's dinner? I can't look at that Papa picture without wanting to cry. <laughs> like who does that to their grandfather? Crying emojis. Kelsey's tweet about sad Papa was going absolutely viral. This thing would go on to get 100,000 retweets in just a few hours. And both her and Papa were completely floored with the reaction that the internet was giving them. While many of the tweets were generally statements of sympathy, there were some users who were actively looking to find the other grandkids online and call them out for flaking on Papa. And Kelsey would go on to admit that Twitter users had been sending death threats to her cousins and the whole situation had been blown completely out of proportion. Papa is okay guys, I promise, and he loves all grandkids equally. Please stop sending my cousins death threats. Everything is okay. One of the grandkids who had been identified on Twitter was Brock Harmon, who after Kelsey's tweet went viral would go to Papa's house the following day and ate lunch with Papa himself. He posted this tweet. Guys, don't worry. I came to Papa's house and I'm having a burger with him. But despite his effort to appear, this wasn't enough. He was still getting hateful reactions from Twitter. Why just now? Oh, so you can go after you go viral, but not before. You better be apologizing. So people on Twitter were taking the plight of Sad Papa very personally. It's almost as if Kelsey's cousins had personally betrayed the trust of their own grandpa. So in a sense, Sad Papa not only became a meme, but he became the grandfather of the internet. But with Twitter taking this situation all so seriously, was it really that serious in the first place? I mean, was Sad Papa or was Kenneth Harmon emotionally distraught by his grandchildren not showing up that evening? It turns out that he really wasn't. Now, surely he was a bit disappointed, but in an interview where Daily Mail got the entire family together for lunch, Kelsey, Papa, and the other grandkids helped give better context to what Papa was going through at the time and also describe who he is as a person and better define his personality. Check out this interview right here. I have a solemn look sometimes. People say I don't smile enough. 
just my personality. He's just very sarcastic. Papa's very sarcastic, like with everything. And was he really sad? No. No. As soon as I saw the picture, I was like, that's just his face. <laughs> I always want everybody to be there, but uh, I don't get upset about things like that. I, I think that's where people went wrong is like they don't understand that yeah. we are a very family oriented family. We, it's not like we. Ditched we just ditched yeah. our family. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. see him. Yeah. We see him regularly. So, uh, I wasn't like the the picture show. This thing has exploded. Now. After watching this interview, you know, I can't help but feel as though Kelsey was clout chasing super hard with that tweet she made. Because this entire interview undermines the sentiment behind her tweet. It seems as though Papa didn't even give a shit and she was just milking the situation for some followers. But anyways. Now the funniest part about this whole story, it's not this interview, it's not the whole reaction from Twitter, although that's definitely a huge component of it. It's really the ending of this story. The ending of this is funny, but it's also one of the more wholesome things that we got out of 2016. Because of the massive online fame Pawpaw gained and the supportive outcry from the internet, the family decided the one thing they could do to give back would be to have a public cookout open to everyone to attend on March 26th to show their appreciation for the sympathetic comments that Twitter users had gave to them. The announcement was put up by one of the grandchildren, Brock Harmon. Just got done talking to Papa, and he wants to invite everyone out for a burger next Saturday. Papa would like me to formally announce he's having a cookout next Saturday on March 26th from 11 to 4. Papa will be cooking burgers. Burgers will be $2 a burger. We will also be selling t-shirts with a picture of Papa on them and this saying, I had a burger with Papa. This is an invitation for everyone who would like to come. Papa said he will cook and take pictures all day if people show up. This cookout will take place in 15835 State Highway 39, Purcell, Oklahoma 73080. Bring your friends and family out and have a burger with Papa. Again, this is an open invitation for everyone. The cookout would turn out to be a massive success with hundreds showing up. Some local residents, some traveling across the states, and some even coming from different countries including Australia and Germany. And here's some clips from the cookout. Enjoy. Hard to believe that this many people are excited about a cookout. Yes, more than one person showed up for burgers with Sad Papa this time around. Sad Papa, whose story went viral on the internet recently, hosted a cookout Saturday and people from all over came to a small Oklahoma town to attend. There's folks here from Pennsylvania, Virginia, New York, California, Germany. And on Saturday, hundreds snapped up the $2 burgers and bought I Ate a Burger with Papa t-shirts. This was really good. It was real juicy, real flavorful. It was awesome. And you guys came all the way from Wisconsin? Yep, absolutely. Uh, it's the middle part of Wisconsin, so if it's the glove, it'd be like right there. Okay. From Crestview, Florida. Or from where? Crestview. Crestview. Is that it's by like, the beach? Yeah, it's like 20 minutes from Destin. Where are you from? <laughs> About eight miles from here, and we debated where or not it was why. I really want to cop one of those, I ate a burger with sad Papa t-shirts, but I guess if I had one, I'd be a liar because, well, I, I didn't eat a burger with sad Papa. But after the cookout, sad Papa went back to living a normal life, as with many obscure internet memes do. And as far as I understand, he's doing okay. I think he's just living that retired life. There's a tweet by Kelsey Harmon pretty recently, early of January 2019, where she says, how are people still concerned about my grandpa? I don't think she would have put a tweet out about him if there was something wrong with him. So I'm assuming that everything with Sad Papa is okay. If anyone knows anything different, let me know. But shout out to Papa and shout out to the Harmon family. Your boy Wavy Web Surf loves him. A good wholesome meme. And by golly, that was the most wholesome meme that we probably got out of 2016. And what begins as a silly meme on Facebook eventually turns into a historical meme gathering of individuals in the United States with the first name Josh, all coming together and fighting for the title of being the king of all Joshes. This is the story of the Josh fight. The day of me filming this video, April 24th of 2021, will go down as an important day in internet meme history. 
Why? Well, because the Josh Swain fight actually happened. Don't know what I'm talking about? Well, allow me to explain. You guys are in for one hell of a story. To begin, let's go back exactly one year from today, April 24th of 2020. A Facebook user named Josh Swain logs in and creates a group message adding dozens of other people also named Josh Swain and subsequently writes this. You're probably wondering why I've gathered you all here today. One of the other Josh Swains replies, because we all share the same name? And the OG Josh says, precisely. April 24th of 2021, 12 p.m. Meet at these coordinates. We fight. Whoever wins gets to keep the name. Everyone else has to change their name. You have to prepare. Good luck. And for those curious, the coordinates listed in the message pointed to a large field just west of Lincoln, Nebraska, right off Interstate 80. Now, I think it goes without saying that this was most likely a joke. You know, the concept of challenging everybody else with your name to a battle royale fight to the death, winner keeps the name scenario. It's just absurd and ridiculous, right? Josh Swain would share a screenshot of his Josh Swain group message to Twitter later that day with the caption, there can only be one. People thought the gag was humorous and the tweet actually went somewhat viral. And there were many people in the replies of the tweet sort of ironically backing the idea of this Josh fight and saying that they would go to it to watch the spectacle. But it was pretty obvious that most people were taking this as a joke. And it really seemed like at the time that the Josh fight would die with this tweet. But curiously, it didn't. Now I reckon if you guys watch this channel, you probably remember the Storm Area 51 situation from 2019, where a Facebook user created a tongue-in-cheek event post suggesting that if the internet banded together in real life, it would be possible for us to Storm Area 51 because, you know, well, they couldn't stop us all. The Storm Area 51 thing was a Facebook meme that sort of took a life of its own, and this Josh Swain thing, well, it worked similarly to that and also got out of control pretty fast. With Storm Area 51, still somewhat fresh in the memory of those invested in meme culture, the Josh Swain fight seemed like another opportunity to manifest a meme into reality. So throughout 2020, you would see memes intermittently popping up referencing the Josh Swain fight across a slew of social media platforms with users jokingly portraying what the event might look like and sort of advertising it in a roundabout way. Eventually, it would become more difficult to parse out jokes from people actually taking this seriously and the prospect of the event actually taking place was looking like it could be possible. The hype around the event became more realized in 2021 with hundreds of people on subreddits like R Swain Bowl unironically expressing their intent to attend the Josh fight. And when April came around, the month that the fight was supposed to take place, chatter around this topic turned into a roar and it really was looking like there was about to be a flock of people showing up to the middle of nowhere in this field in Nebraska. What did the original Josh Swain who started this meme have to say about this? Well, by the time April had come around, not much had been said from the original Josh. But on April 17th, a troubling post would appear on the Josh Swain Battle subreddit that would prompt a response from him. The Redditor who posted this thread had two concerns regarding the event. The first concern was that there was construction that was blocking the primary route to where these coordinates were. The second concern was that, well, these coordinates, they were on someone's private property. The post reads, scouted the location, slight problem, need immediate clarification. Elaborating on the first issue, he says, that gives us problem number one. There's a ton of construction blocking the north entrance to the road. If you're going yourself, you need to come from south of I-80. And then he elaborates on his second concern. When I got there, I pulled in and there's a bunch of big red barns and buildings with this red brick house out front. When I rang the doorbell after a while, this old gentleman came out to greet me. So problem number two, he had no idea what was going on and didn't even know anyone named Josh Swain. After a brief talk, I gave him some forewarning that a bunch of people might show up at his house randomly on the 24th and took my leave. Too long didn't read, we might have the wrong address. Someone needs to sort this out in less than a week or we might have a problem. The original Josh Swain was pinged in the thread and he had this to say, Hey, I'm actually the Josh Swain that created the group chat and posted the original message to my Twitter here. Thank you for bringing this up. 
To be totally honest, I did not intend for this to actually happen. I picked the coordinates totally at random as the geographical center of the United States. This is actually somewhat concerning. Is there any way I can contact you and maybe help mitigate this issue? I do intend to be there. However, I don't want to make it a burden on some innocent landowner nearby, and it would be helpful to have someone familiar with the area to contact. I'll PM you some of my contact info. And not long after this interaction, a makeshift sign would appear on the old man's property informing those who might show up that the event wouldn't be taking place in this lot. At this point, it appeared as if Josh was taking some actual responsibility for the event itself, almost acting as an organizer of it. After all, he knew that if he didn't rein in this madness, there could be hundreds of people showing up to some random guy's house and who knows what kind of trouble that could get you in. So on April 20th, just four days before the event, Josh Swain would make a post to the Josh Swain Battle subreddit, the primary planning hub Redditors were using for the event. Rather than discouraging people from coming, he gave well thought out and clear instructions for anyone planning to attend the event. It is a lengthy post, but the too long didn't read version is that the location was changed to a public park and that there would actually be no blood sports involved. Instead, anybody named Josh Swain would be allowed to enter a rock, paper, scissors tournament and anyone with the first name Josh would be allowed to participate in a free for all battle with pool noodles. He also encouraged people to bring non-perishable goods for a food drive and started a donation fund for losers of the battle to change their name and some of the money was going to a medical center foundation. And finally here, I would like to read off just a personal note given from him in this instruction thread. Like I said, it's not often that someone has the opportunity to have the attention and focus of a large number of people, and so I thought it would be a great idea to use this spotlight to bring word to a few worthy causes. Please consider donating to show the world how the internet can turn an exercise and absurdity into something beautiful. And with the original Josh Swain co-signing the event, it was looking like the thing was set in stone and was actually gonna happen. There were many people saying that they would be present and live stream the events for other people to watch if they couldn't come. Whatever the case, over the next four days, the internet would just have to wait anxiously to see if the Josh Swain fight was gonna happen or if it would be a disappointing flop like the Storm Area 51 event was. April 24th, 2021, the day had come. And lo and behold, did the Joshes come out in full force. Streams began to pop up. While they were in low quality, thanks to Nebraska internet, it showed a mass of people at the park. It was really happening. The event began with the original Josh Swain acting as an MC and starting off the event where he rock, paper, scissors battled the only other Josh Swain that attended. And it was a tense rock, paper, scissors battle. <laughs> The OG Josh Swain that started it all won the battle and retained his right to the Josh Swain namesake. Following the rock, paper, scissors battle, people with the first name Josh were permitted to duke it out in a multi-stage pool noodle battle winner of which would get a pool noodle signed by all combatants and would be given the title of Ultimate Josh. After many rounds, a winner was finally decided. They call him Little Josh. The Josh to rule all Joshes, the king of them all, baby. And that really was it. A hundred plus people came out for about an hour or so to make internet history. OG Josh Swain kept his title as the Josh Swain, and he's definitely going down as an internet legend for accidentally pulling off what has likely been the greatest meme-inspired IRL gathering 
witnessed in history. From what I understand, Josh Swain was able to raise over $6,000 from the event that's going to charity, and they also got non-perishable goods to donate to food banks. I mean, at the end of the day, this is one of the most wholesomely badass things I've ever seen. There's probably going to be more high quality footage uploaded by people at the event over the next few days and you'll be able to get a more in-person feel for what it was like. Unfortunately, the streams that are available now when I'm making the video aren't that great, but you can still see the spectacle of it all and appreciate it for what it is. But it, holy shit, man, I was inspired by this and just had to hop on here and talk about it with you guys. If you were around in the early days of YouTube, a comedy video series known as Unforgivable, it was unescapable. Unforgivable. While these comedy skits are fondly remembered, few know the touching story behind the two young men responsible for this early viral hit. In what's likely one of the most beautiful creative friendships in internet history, this is the story of Hodge Stanson. So really the biggest question I see when it comes to the Unforgivable video series is who is the Unforgivable guy? The Unforgivable guy is a Texas born screenwriter named Gunnar Stanson. Born October 1st, 1986, Gunner first began creating short films in the early 2000s, alongside someone who would become his longtime friend and creative mentor, Logan Hodge. Logan Hodge, born March 28, 1987, met Gunner at a Texarkana, Texas high school during their ninth grade chemistry class as teenagers. The two fostered a strong friendship, with the common interest of music and film serving as the bond between them. They would at one point form a band together in high school but their musical endeavors always took a backseat to their film interests. Finding each other on congruent creative paths, the two formed their film production company called Hodge Stanson, which is a combination of their last names. They were inspired by the likes of filmmakers such as David Lynch, Woody Allen, and David Lean to name a few, and hoped that one day they could create their very own feature-length film. But for the time, they were relegated to making short films. Now their short film work during high school remains largely unknown, but their film work past 2005 after graduating, that's a different story. Coinciding with the year of their graduation, YouTube was released and it was quickly becoming the hub for online video content. As it grew, the filmmaking duo would see potential in the site as a way to broadcast their projects to the masses. They would officially create their Hodge Stanson YouTube channel on July 3rd, 2006. Behind the scenes, they had been experimenting with both scripted and unscripted video content for YouTube. Gunner typically acted in the projects with Logan directing and holding the camera, but this wasn't always the case as there are many examples of Logan acting as well. Now despite all their efforts writing and scripting short films, it would ultimately be an unscripted, improvised monologue performed by Gunner that would bring fame to the duo. And I think it goes without saying that that unscripted, improvised monologue was unforgivable, uploaded on August 22nd of 2006. And boy did this unforgivable video blow up. It's really hard to explain how big it was for the time, not only in the sense of views, but also just the general impact that it had on YouTube and its community as a whole. The video became so popular that it inspired hundreds of parody videos from YouTubers across the site. Someone making a parody of another YouTube video is pretty commonplace now, but at the time that was kind of unheard of. You mostly saw parodies of TV shows or movies, but a parody of a YouTuber was something new, and I think that speaks to the greatness of the unforgivable video. People really fell in love with Gunner and his hilarious performance, making him somewhat of a proto-YouTube celebrity, one of the first. And of course, this video wouldn't have been possible without the direction and background chuckling of Logan. It was definitely a collaborative endeavor, and one that brought fame to the Hodge Stanson Productions name. The video and its catchphrase became so popular that for a short time, the Hodge Stanson channel had officially licensed unforgivable merch that was being sold at Hot Topic. And hey, uh, if you happen to have one of these shirts lying around, hit your boy up and might be willing to take it off your hands. But anyways, after the massive success of the first Unforgivable video, the Hodge Stanson boys would go on to create numerous episodes of it, seven in total with three spin-offs. Each episode basically being the same format with the only difference being Gunner's improvised monologues. 
The last Unforgivable episode was uploaded to YouTube on June 5th of 2011, and the series has remained defunct ever since. And this is largely due to Gunner and Logan losing interest in the series. A few months after the final episode in 2011, Gunner and Logan were interviewed by a blog called The Juicy Expressions, and in this blog, viewers finally got some insight into the creative process behind the series. Whose idea was it to film in the woods? Logan, we were filming in the woods already, another movie called Bye, and it was a piece of shit so we got frustrated and we started making our own jokes. What inspired you to make Unforgivable? Gunner. Okay, well here's the story. Logan introduced me to this group of rappers called NWA. He basically introduced me to Ice Cube, and when I heard their lyrics, they were really tyrannical lyrics. I thought it was really funny, and I don't really care about rap, but I thought that they were really funny, and it made me start thinking about saying really crazy things. Also, inspiration came from the P. Diddy commercial for Unforgivable Cologne. The Unforgivable Cologne commercial was banned from television because they had a crazy interracial scene. And for those curious, here's the commercial he's talking about. <laughs> None of them are pussy and got her pregnant. <laughs> What's weird is I actually remember seeing this commercial from back in the day, but never really made the connection. So you heard it first here. Unforgivable was partly inspired by some P. Diddy cologne. You can't make this stuff up, guys. This interview also contains a rather interesting portion which explains why the creators lost interest in making the Unforgivable series. The two seem to express some disappointment that the unscripted, low-effort Unforgivable series completely overshadowed their more fleshed out and artistic short films that they had been creating for their channel. Unforgivable has 16,552,294 views as of July 5th at 6.58pm. How did it make you feel to know that the video was so successful. Gunner. It makes me feel kind of dejected because it's kind of unfair because the projects that we actually worked on and had a goal at hand didn't do as well as Unforgivable. We'd like people to spend time with them. Unforgivable was like a fluke. LOL, I find myself laughing at it each time. Logan. We spent so little time with Unforgivable that it's hard for us to feel what others feel about it because it literally took no effort at all. What are your goals for your videos? Gunner. I don't have any goals really as far as the videos go. Unforgivable really came from boredom and we were misguided on another project we were doing and it just kind of happened so there was no goal there. But for our other videos, I would like for people to watch and support. Logan. Yeah, we really would like for people to take the time out and get to know us and our new videos. This brings me to a point in the narrative that I've neglected to elaborate on thoroughly. That point being, Gunner and Logan never intended on Unforgivable to become their main bread and butter content. It was always an afterthought. The content that they really poured their heart and soul into were the various short film projects they had been creating since 2006. Standouts include a short film they created called The Visitor, another short film called The Long Afternoon, and an episodic sitcom they created called Fruitheads. Gunner and Logan had hoped that they could potentially use the attention garnered from the Unforgivable series to attract fans for their various passion projects, but unfortunately this never truly became a reality. Ultimately, the Hodge Stanson brand would forever be defined by Unforgivable, and the other projects failed to ever really take off. Without much of an explanation, uploads on the channel ceased in late 2011, and sometime after, the Unforgivable videos were unexpectedly unlisted from the channel. For the time being, fans would be left in the dark. The two would eventually return in October of 2015, and this time with a trailer for a film that they had apparently been working on for years called Florence, a matter between two detectives. While it was released on the Hodge Stanson channel, the movie is credited under Logan's then recently established production company called The North American Kino Eye. Directed by Logan and featuring Gunner as a detective, the hour and a half long feature film was published two days after the trailer dropped. It remained up for a limited period of time and only received a few thousand views. Florence in its entirety has since vanished from the internet and it's rather difficult to locate nowadays with only traces of it being available via Wayback Machine shenanigans. Apparently it was a pretty solid movie receiving an 8.5 on IMDb though only 6 people have given it a score. After the publication of Florence, the Hodge Stanson channel would fall dormant again and in all reality this was kind of the end of the project. 
Honestly though, I don't think there could have been a better way to cap off this collaborative project between Gunner and Logan because after all, one of their biggest goals was to create a feature length film and well, they were finally able to do it. After the end of the Hodge Stanson project on YouTube in 2015, it's rumored that the two parted ways amicably with Gunner moving to upstate New York for unknown reasons and Logan remaining in Texas. And at this point, it gets a bit muddy in regards as to what the two individuals were up to in their personal lives, more so with Gunner who never really kept up with social media. But we do know what happened to Logan. Logan had maintained a Twitter for quite some time and it appears that he had begun to prioritize his creative efforts to music production. Something he had low key dabbled in for years but started to take more seriously. Logan would go on to join a hip hop collective based out of Oakland, California called Green Over Records, which he collaborated with for many years despite him living in Texas. His most notable musical achievement was the production of an experimental electronic slash industrial hip hop album called 12 Living Generations. This album would catch the eye of Universal Records and he would be signed to the label sometime in 2017. Things were really looking up for Logan, but unfortunately, as 2018 came around, tragedy struck. On March 9th, 2018, just 19 days before his 31st birthday, Logan Hodge was found dead in his Bowie County, Texas home. The cause of his death isn't publicly available information, and out of respect for Logan Hodge, I will avoid any speculation on this matter. Logan's untimely death likely weighed heavy on those close to him, and it would certainly be devastating news for his longtime friend, collaborator, and man he considered a brother, Gunnar Stanson. After receiving the news of Logan's passing, Gunnar honored his friend by relisting all of the unlisted Unforgivable episodes and many other short films they created together on the Hodge Stanson channel that had been unlisted years prior. And to pay further homage, he has recently uploaded previously unseen projects that they had worked on dating back as far as the high school days. In the description box of the original Unforgivable video, Gunner has left a short but endearing message for his dearly departed friend. Rest in peace, Logie Bear. Since meeting each other in that ninth grade chemistry class as teenagers, Gunner and Logan maintained a starry-eyed and obsessive passion for their shared creative interests, drawing inspiration from each other every step of the way. I think the best way to showcase the admiration and respect these two shared for one another is best explained by these two quotes, the first of which is from Gunner. When asked in an interview in 2013 how he met Logan, he responded with this. We met in chemistry class in ninth grade. He served as my stalwart model of an artist. I learned how to behave and conduct myself as such. He also taught me how to establish a template. And to understand how Logan felt about Gunner, all you really need to do is read the notes of the album that got him signed to Universal Records, dedicated to my best friend, Gunner Stanson, without whom this record would have never materialized. Thank you for your generosity, brutal honesty, and endless encouragement. I know you're going to hate me for writing this, but you deserve it. This man came up with a Kickstarter idea that was so stupid that in a weird way, it was actually kind of genius. And the internet would rally behind the man to make his potato salad fantasies a reality. This is the story of the potato salad Kickstarter. Our potato salad story begins on July 3rd of 2014 when a post appears on Kickstarter simply titled Potato Salad. This campaign page featured a stock image of some admittedly delicious looking potato salad and a brief note from the campaign's creator, entrepreneur and software developer Zach Danger Brown. In the description area, he writes, I am making a potato salad. He elaborates further, basically, I'm just making a potato salad. I haven't decided what kind yet. And in regard to the amount of funding that Zach was requesting for this project, he only wanted $10. $10, it's a modest request, probably just the amount you need to buy a bag of potatoes and the fixins needed to create the carbohydrate concoction that is potato salad. You know, fucking mayo, potatoes, uh, herbs, stuff like that. Now with donation rewards, like you get to receive a bite of this hypothetical potato salad if the campaign is successful, you would imagine that no one would donate to this shit and it would quickly fall into obscurity. You think it would be skimmed over, no one would pay it any mind, and it would basically receive no funding. But that's not what happened. Interestingly, the ludicrously mundane nature of the Kickstarter drew attention to it almost immediately after it was posted, and donors would begin stepping up. 
but why? Well, this is the internet. Dumbass shit like this happens all the time, but I'll do my best to explain why I think this happened. Zach Brown's potato salad Kickstarter could almost be viewed as a parody or a satire of a normal Kickstarter. A joke mocking the often indulgent nature of online crowdfunding in general. The simplicity of Zach's potato salad request, it was just such a novelty. And this was one of the first real meta jabs at the concept of online crowdfunding in general. There was humor to this. It was so simple. It was so stupid. That's kind of what made it stand out amongst all of these hyper serious campaigns trying to build a rocket and send it to Mars. This guy just wanted to make a bowl of potato salad. Who can't get on board with that? This campaign got attention almost immediately. Attention that initially came from, you guessed it, Reddit. One Redditor would post a link to the potato salad Kickstarter to the offbeat subreddit around the time it was posted. The post intrigued users, with many expressing support for the campaign and voicing their intents to contribute to it. Why the fuck didn't I think of this? With the Redditors pushing the campaign, it would explode in popularity and funding. Zach's quest to make potato salad was being backed by a spirit bomb of Redditors and this support would only grow with time. After the initial Reddit push, Zach's Kickstarter began to receive additional media coverage. Outlets like BuzzFeed, Uprox, and The Verge all talked about it over the course of the first week, flooding the page with new visitors and subsequent donations. The Kickstarter was quickly becoming a viral spectacle, a spectacle that even the main mainstream media would comment on. The idea is simple. Donate money to make a batch of potato salad. If you donate at least $5, you get to pick an ingredient, and we all have our twists. Probably be some, you know, Thousand Island. Ketchup and mustard. BW3's wing sauce. Cinnamon, yeah. But for Zach? There's that potato salad, like the yellow one. I really like that one. Around this time, Zach would play into the hype, adding new stretch goals to his campaign to incentivize donations, which included promises of merch, a live donor name reading, the development of a potato salad cookbook, and even vague promises of a venue rental so that the campaign donors could all come together and throw a big party and I guess eat potato salad. Yeah, this was a lot of promises, and at the time it was really difficult to gauge how serious Zach Brown was about this. Was this just some sort of joke for him that he would milk until the last second and then abruptly end the campaign and refund everybody? Or was he actually gonna make a fuckload of potato salad and go through with these promises? Thank you so much. Um, I, I could never have done this without you and your support. Um, I've been hard at work in the kitchen, uh, learning how to boil potatoes. Now, considering that one of the main rewards was that Zach would send you a bite of this hypothetical potato salad through the mail, uh, you have to wonder how he's gonna follow through with this considering there's thousands of people donating and you know, you really can't mail potato salad. The shit would spoil. The feasibility of such a feat was discussed during a Reddit AMA when asked what he would be doing about the issue of refrigeration when sending salad rewards to donors, he said the following. Yeah, it's gonna be a challenge. I would have put it under risks if I had ever considered that anyone outside of Columbus would want some. I thought I'd just go to people's houses and hand it off. With that, you can really tell that he never expected any of this. He thought it might have just been something that he could manage locally, but nah, there were people across the world donating to this campaign. By this point, it was just a handful of days into the campaign and Zach's joke Kickstarter launched back on July 3rd already had some real cash behind it. By July 7th, it managed to raise more than $15,000. And thanks to a big media push on July 8th, just a day later, that same campaign would be at $40,316. It was growing like crazy, and there was still 24 days to go in the campaign by this point. And thanks to the power of the Wayback Machine, we can actually go day by day and see the amount of this campaign rise over time. Now, no chargebacks do cause some fluctuations in the amount raised, but uh, I'm going to play for you guys a little video montage of this thing growing. Check it out. The day had come, August 2nd, Zach's potato salad fundraiser finally came to a close, ending with a grand total of $55,492, thanks to contributions from close to 7,000 backers. 
And of course now Zack would have to deliver on his campaign promises. He would have to make a shitload of potato salad. He would have to somehow get this potato salad to the donors. He would have to make a bunch of merch. He would have to get it a venue or throw some sort of potato salad party like he said earlier. How is he gonna do this shit? If he failed to appease donors, he could find himself in trouble with Kickstarter itself and the whole campaign could be deemed invalid and taken down. Which Zack didn't want to happen, he wanted to make internet history in some way here. Zack had to get creative here and come up with a reasonable compromise that people would respect. And that's what he did. Tater salad. Zack would divvy up the money. Some of the money would go towards merch creation, some would go to the creation of an LLC, a lot would go to taxes, and the lump sum that was left would be funding Zach's ambitious charity project, the Potato Salad Festival Potato Stock. This would be the way that everyone could come and actually eat the potato salad that Zach was going to be making. In a serious note, a lot of people have been asking you, yeah. okay, you've got all this money raised now, what sure. do you want to do with it? Yeah, um, you know, what, what I keep Kickstarter's saying... Because Kickstarter is a business right. place, yep. right? Correct. Um, in Kickstarter, uh, the terms of service say that you can't give directly to a charity. Okay. Um, we're looking into uh, ways that we can take the, the remaining money uh -huh. and spend it for the greater good. So what was Potato Stock 2014? The event was set to be held on September 27th, and it would be Zach's way of fulfilling his potato salad promises to donors. Potato Stock was advertised as an admission-free event that would run for eight hours that would feature food trucks, potato salad, of course, booze, music, and other festival-like activities. But the big thing with Potato Stock was is that all of the proceeds generated from selling concessions would go towards a fund to end poverty in his home state of Ohio. Zach had just over a month to make this potato salad festival dream a reality, so he got to work. He managed to get some potato donations from the Idaho Potato Commission and a few other sponsors would also pitch in. Poster advertisements from the time depict Zach in a potato field shooting lasers out of his eyes. He had a bunch of brands on board for this charity project and it was looking like it was going to be a big dub. The campaign backers couldn't have been happier with Zach's decision to host this event and the internet and the media was behind him. Everyone wanted to see it happen. And eventually, after much groundwork, on September 27th, Potato Stock became a reality. Zach Danger Brown, known as the Potato Salad Guy, is the man behind the event. It all started when Brown asked for just $10 on a crowdfunding website to make potato salad, and he ended up raising $55,000. So he used the extra money to throw a party for a good cause. And decided to throw this event here to um, raise money on top of the, the Kickstarter money to benefit the Columbus Foundation. So we've set up a fund at the Columbus Foundation um, that will pay out to nonprofits that are working to end hunger and homelessness in Central Ohio. It's reported that over 1,000 people attended the event throughout the day, some traveling across the country for it. Over 450 pounds of potato salad was whipped up by Zach and company, and those who donated got their fabled bites of potato salad as promised. And on top of that, thousands of dollars would be raised for charity. It was just a wholesome moment. <laughs> Achilles Thugnificent. <laughs> Uh, Ed, uh, Ad Harley, Adam Whisper. With the Potato Stock charity event a success and the Potato Salad campaign over, Zach's internet limelight would begin to fade in the following weeks and months, which was likely a reprieve considering this guy put his entire life on hold for the duration of this unexpected viral blow up. And with that said, it's actually rather impressive that Zach followed through with any of this and went through with his campaign promises. Hell, fulfilling campaign promises is something that serious Kickstarters struggle with, but this joke one was able to do it no problem. Problem. Zach pocketed very little money from this entire endeavor. From what I can tell, the only money that didn't go directly to nonprofit or to provide merchandise for backers went to taxes and creating his LLC. He was still fulfilling stretch goals for donors almost two years after the campaign ended. The last one was the creation of a cookbook for the $50 donors, and he pumped that out finally in 2016. The dude was dedicated to his backers. Zach's potato salad campaign was one of the most bad campaigns at the time, and it will go down as the most unexpectedly successful Kickstarter of all time. 
After becoming a viral legend, Zack would go back to being an entrepreneur and software developer. A lesser known piece of lore about Zack is that this potato salad endeavor wasn't his only joke Kickstarter campaign launched, as about a year later he launched another ridiculous one called a jet ski. The point of this one was to raise money to purchase a jet ski, grind the jet ski into dust, then ship the dust off to the donors, making each donor, technically speaking, a jet ski owner. Yeah, it's crazy. The reason you've probably never heard of this one is because it wasn't successful. It was a swing and a miss, but the attempt sure is a testament to Zack's humorous personality. 